So good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you uh, to the panel History and Epigraphy on this last uh, sixth and last day of the conference, whether it is very early for you in the morning, like for me in California, or later, uh, later hour of the day. My name is Christelle fischer Bove. I'm an Associate Professor of Classics and History at USC, and I will be presiding the session and, and be keeping track of time. So we have a full panel of six speakers, the first two on um, the Classical and Hellenistic period, followed by four papers on the Roman period. So I will only introduce very briefly the speakers to save time for questions, and questions will take place after each talk. At is uh, as it has become usual now, uh, you can type your question in the chat or simply write question uh, and we will unmute you and you will ask your question or you can raise your hand, a virtual hand. Um, make sure to you have downloaded the handouts. There are three of them and the first one you will need right away. It's actually called handout two. So you may just download the, the three of them. Without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker. Brad Cook is an associate professor of classics at the University of Mississippi, where he teaches Greek, Latin, and courses on Greek culture. He has published articles on the lives and tradition about Demosthenes, Philip II, Alexander the Great, and Cicero, Cicero II. Now, uh, Philip V is being added to the list as he readies for publication the inscribed object, and a very beautiful one, uh, as you will see, um, of his talk, which is part of the David M. Robinson Memorial Collection of Greek and Roman Antiquities at the University of Mississippi. The title of the paper is A Golden Treaty for Philip V. Brad, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Fisher Bove. Uh, let me get my screen share working. And that is working, yes? Yes. Good. Um, many thanks, uh, Dr. Fisher Bove, for being a model chair in this virtual and challenging format. Um, there is, as, as she mentioned, a handout um, with a color image, which saves, of course, on printing, since we're doing this strange way of things. Uh, transcription and essential bibliography. Um, there and here, now that screen share is working, is a gold inscribed tablet connected to Philip V that has been in Oxford, Mississippi, since David M. Robinson's residence here, 1948 to 1958, and it has yet to be published. It is inescapable that these particular features, that it is made of gold, that it is related to a historically prominent person, I mean, Philip V, and that has been unpublished for so long raises questions that affect this presentation. My goal today is to present this object and address four questions that have harried me as I prepare it for publication. Um, and for other issues, um, please feel free to contact me by email. The Greek text. Horkos sumakos estomai katata sun kemen alusima keosi kai e antes i ei epi philippon epi polamo e epi lusima keas boi thein philippo lusima keas kai lusima keas philippon. Physical characteristics. The tablet is small, fitting in the palm of your hand, nine centimeters square with a triangular pediment at top making the total height 12.5 centimeters. The thickness varies from two to three tenths of a millimeter around the edges, though it is even thinner in the lower right section as seen in this x-ray image where the tablet has been stressed and a fracture or tear developed at some time resulting in a triangular section breaking off. There are no mounting holes and the 10 lines of Greek text have been scribed or more precisely traced into the gold with a stylus or tracer. Here's a close-up view of the furrow left by the stylus in round and straight and round letters with the punched dot seraphing, as I call it. The text was placed so that a margin 
of a centimeter or more of gold formed a gleaming frame, a halo around the text. At top center uh, in the pedimental triangle is in repoussé, a female head in profile with a Corinthian helmet. Um, uh, the image of Athena is on so many coins or like the image of Athena. And just below the last line of the 10 line text centered appears a thunderbolt also in repoussé. Now a snapshot of Lysimachaea, the history of Lysimachaea and relevant history of Philip. Lysim Lysimachus, one of Alexander's successors, founded Lysimachaea in 309 BC at the head of the Chersonese, sidestepping centuries old Cardia just to the west, thereby creating a strategic possession for those wishing to cross and control the Hellespont over the ensuing centuries. Passing down to the reign of Philip V, uh, we find Lysimachaea in a new alliance with him as of 202 BC. But when Rome declared war on Macedon in 200 BC, Philip withdrew the trips, troops he had at Lysimachaea. And soon after that, in 198 BC, the city was laid waste by Thracians. Anastatos is the adjective used by Philip in the slight textual evidence for this treaty in Polybius. Inscriptional evidence of this alliance was discovered in 1915 by Georgios Ichonomos near Zion, Macedonia's venue for displaying such dis uh, records. 40 years later, Louis Robert, working in the Istanbul Museum, noticed a marble shield, 33 centimeters in diameter, reported in 1942 as found at Bolayir, the Turkish name for the site that we now know for certain was Lysimachaea with a club carved in relief across its middle and Filippu carved in relief beneath. And at top, though broken, enough of a sigma survives at right to show that Basileus was carved above. Robert concluded that this shield must have been part of some sort of monument marking Philip V's relationship with Lysimachaea, which ended up lasting only that short time, 2021 to 199 8 BC. Into this noteworthy historical context, I would like to add this gold tablet as a third artifact to bear witness to this short-lived alliance. Though the frustrating absence of information about the modern discovery of this artifact hangs over this presentation as yet another lamentable example of the inestimable importance of archeological context. So my first question, why has this artifact never been published? David and Robinson, best known for his long career at Johns Hopkins, 1905 to 1947, spent the last decade of his life teaching at the University of Mississippi, persuaded to move there by William H. Willis, chair of classics at the university where he'd been teaching since 1946, though he is better known for his illustrious career at Duke. In Robinson's collection at his death in January, 1958, half of which, and that half is in dollar terms, ended up remaining in Oxford, and among them was this gold tablet. Where and when he acquired it is recorded nowhere in the boxes of documents still at the university. Robinson had, as George Hanfman said in the 1961 catalog of the half of the Robinson collection that went to Harvard, quote, a praiseworthy habit of speedy publication. This is true of his vases, for which his collection is best known, as well as the sculpture and jewelry. And by the way, at the Harvard website, you can teleport back to the exhibit of 1961 with linked images of over 100 of the 410 artifacts that they acquired. But speedy publication cannot be said of the over two dozen inscriptions in Robinson's original collection. Only four of the stone inscriptions um, were published by Robinson, three in the same year, 1937, and two of his four metal inscriptions, one of those in 1938. About this atypical absence of publication, William Willis commented in 1987 to Robert Moisey, who is retired now from the University of Mississippi, but was then publishing most of Robinson's inscriptions that remained here, Quote, this is Willis, perhaps because he valued them most highly, he kept them sequestered, unquote. 
As for the lack of publication of this gold tablet, this too has a connection to William Willis in that its publication had been entrusted to Willis by Robinson himself. But when Willis, born and bred in Mississippi, because of his active support of James Meredith in the school year 1962-3 was, quote, forcibly advised, unquote, to leave, he moved to Duke and took on such a host of new responsibilities that the publishing of this gold tablet in Oxford never matured. Willis took with him, though, a photo and transcript of the tablet to Duke, and in the mid-1970s, he showed those images to Kent Rigsby, who, 40 years later, contacted me after my arrival here and asked me what I could discover about the tablet's status. Such is my explanation of how only in uh, relatively recent history, perhaps as much as a century, if we push back the possible date of Robinson's acquisition of this, perhaps as much of a century more, um, this is finally getting some press. So my second question, are any physical features of the tablet inconsistent with manufacture around 200 BC? XRF scans of the tablet, and here my colleague in geology is assisting or really doing that, they just made me pose. <clears throat> um, front and back um, give readings of 99.79 to 100% gold. Nothing odd is present, at least on the surface. Variation in thickness of the tablet is consistent with ancient manufacturing, which is to say it varies. The repoussé work and the style of the helmeted head and thunderbolt look consistent with ancient examples, though I remain curious that the most uh, similar comparanda are both from the fifth century BC. The lettering is artfully marked by, by what I am calling uh, dot serif lettering. And this is technically a footnote, but one that's of great interest. I offer quotes in which various scholars, at least in English and one in Italian, have commented on this feature from a variety of fields, though no standardized term has yet been established. I suggest dot serif lettering. Though found earlier than the Hellenistic period, as with ordinary serifs, dot serifing uh, had by then become ubiquitous on coinage. Uh, Philippu, for instance, here. Here's a close up of uh, Philippu from the coin at top, the three Philippus uh, from the tablet beneath, um, and on surviving bronze inscriptions. This is the norm, um, one of the many intelliplaques with dot seraphing. Is then anything about the lettering on the gold tablet inconsistent with lettering of 200 BC? And pardon me if it seems like I'm asking my questions backwards. This is intentional. Here are the x-ray images of the tablet uh, and all the letters, every single one on the inscription. Here, though on stone, are a sample of the letters from the Dion fragment of the Alliance, unquestionably dated. Consider, for example, the epsilons and the p's, since with epsilons, the presence of shorter middle strokes and with p's, the longer hostas or right, right hostas or legs are commonly seen as a development arising in the third century and becoming the norm in the second. We could work through every single one of these letters, by the way, but in short, uh, the forms of the letters on the gold tablet are just what you would expect for 200 BC. So question three, are any textual features of the tablet inconsistent with a date of 200 BC? The text on the gold tablet is an epitome, and this is essential um, to keep in mind. Um, Horkos, it's an oath. Sumakos esomai, I swear to be an ally. Three, katatas tum kemena lusemakelsi. This is how they, uh, uh, the creator of the epitome, uh, summarized all of the many, many uh, um, sub clauses. Um, and it is with the lusemakeans. This phrase, by the way, suggests that flip is the reader of the tablet. Four, if either party is attacked, they will aid one another, the heart of the treaty. How do these clauses compare with what is in the Dion inscription? As common in extant treaty inscriptions, the actual terms of the treaty embodied in the oaths taken by the two parties are often prefaced by the text of the proceedings that led to the treaty. And such is the case with the Dion inscription only down at line 17. And this is only of what's extant, which is, I should say, what is published of what's extant. This is on the handout. We see intact the phrase, uh, the title, Horkos Lusimakaon. 
The verb of othing, om nuo, is intact, as also in the last line is the start of what must have been Philip's oath, om nuo. The gold tablet uh, starts with horkos, um, but compresses that om nuo clause into the word horkos. The dion text follows uh, with a long list of deities, again, compressed into that horkos clause on the gold tablet, but it has that essential first verb reasonably supplied here in line 19 of the Dion fragment, emeno in te pilia kai sumakea, I shall abide by the friendship and alliance. This use of abstract forms, which are often paired like this, is as old and as common as the personal adjective noun forms, um, as on the gold tablet, in classical and Hellenistic treaties. Uh, it's universal, um, there's no separate distinction. It may seem odd to find sumakos SMI, the personal form, on the gold tablet when the Dion inscription has the abstract form, but it shows that the creator of the gold epitome is comfortable with making such alterations. And, and we see the mixture of these two forms in some cases in a single inscription, the personal and the abstract. The if clause, which is the heart of the gold tablet, is sadly lost on the Dion fragments, except for the eon though similar inscriptions uh, can permit a reconstruction. And here is a fuller restoration. If we follow this, um, what we find is in the uh, a similarity to the sumakos contrast uh, in between the two, in the Dion restoration, this version of it, um, we see polamo, antes polamo, polame, excuse me, a uh, single verb, instead of the verb to go and the prepositional phrase epipolamo, which is on the gold tablet. But again, both of these versions are common in the classical and the Hellenistic period. These are not uh, temporal markers. We have though, another inscription, which happens to have a Macedonian connection, um, which has a similar if clause, as well as the infinitive boethane, as well as the personal form of sumakos, though in the plural. It was found at Olynthus and records the local copy of an alliance between Amyntas III and the Chalcidians. Um, this is not on the handout, though it should have been. Of particular interest is how these eight lines of the Olynthus inscription, and this is only the, uh, this is not the entire inscription, it's also inscribed on the back, parallel the gold tablet in looking like an epitome. This particular version from Olynthus, um, uh, made for Olynthus, as the first line suggests, treaty with Amyntas, son of Aridias. Mention of the Olynthians is deemed unnecessary, then followed by the phrasing that includes both parties. It is possible, though, that the similarities between the Olynthus uh, stone inscription and the gold tablet could rouse suspicion that the Olynthus inscription, which has long been known, directly inspired the wording of the gold tablet. And let me be clear, I mean in the modern period. The gold tablet, however, displays sufficient differences from the Olynthus text to question this suspicion. One, while the stone tablet has the generic plural accusative uh, infinitive sumakos ein aleloisi, the gold tablet has the singular indicative sumakos esomai. Two, while the Olynthus if clause has the ap plus accusative of, atta of attacked entity in front of the verb with addition of eistein koren, the gold tablet has just the two uh, ap prepositional phrases and places them both after the verb. Three, while the Olynthus inscription follows the boy thing with the accusative subject, then the date of a person attacked or aided, excuse me, the gold um, tablet puts the accusative after the dative. These many and varied differences do not suggest any direct textual dependence of the one on the other, ancient or modern, quite the opposite. But to dispel suspicion of modern copy fully, we must consider the accusative plural endings of Lucy Makaos that appear twice in, on the gold tablet in line seven and nine. It is generally observed that these eos endings start to be replaced by eis in the fourth century and become so rare over the course of the third century in Attic inscriptions that, quote, after 200 BC, only eis is attested in prose, and that is to say versus metrical inscriptions. It is true, though, 
Is that true though, outside of Attica? I admit that the one example of an inscribed accusative plural form of Lusa Macaus that I can find does use the eis form in an inscription at Ilion uh, of the third century BC. But from my search for such endings of these civic substantive, substantive adjective forms in eos, accusatives at all are in fact quite rare. Yet here are five intact examples of use in the Hellenistic period two on Euboea, one in Megara, two in Asia Minor, four of the five dated to the second century, showing the continued use of this form. The gold tablet supplies a sixth example. So the real question, what is the function of this object? The function of the inscription of the treaty at Dion is not mysterious, even in its fragmentary state. It is a local copy of which there would be at least two or more, as is known from so many extant examples of inscriptions in which the publication inscriptions uh, survive. On the other side at Lysimachaea, the marble shield survives as an element of some sort of figurative and literal monument to this alliance, though it can only be a suggest suggestion that it was erected by the Lysimachaeans to display to Philip and his troops, how substantive was their need for his club and shield. The gold tablet though, has no fine context to help us determine its original purpose and who purposed it. Nevertheless, its pedimental shape, similar to so many larger bronze plaques of cities honoring individuals found all over the Greek world, provides a special place for the helmeted head of Athena, a ubiquitous symbol true, which signals as known numismatically, marked relevance for both Lysimachaea and Philip. With Athena looking on, the tablet has real weight in your hand. And this is a cardboard cutout, by the way. <laughs> and that's 100% the right size. In your hand, displaying an effectively epitomized text that is especially legible with the elegant additions of this dot seraphim. As with the stone shield, whether this tablet was made by the Lysimachians as a gift for Philip to thank him and to remind him of their alliance, or whether Philip had it made like a trophy or as a thank offering of his success in establishing this alliance, even bereft of its archeological context, the tablet embodies the importance of that alliance and those oaths sworn by a king and a polis for mutual aid. Thank you. I will pull out of screen share though. Thank you very uh, much. I fear uh, we may need to refer back to it. So thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm now opening the floor to questions. So anybody can just uh, raise your hand or write in the chat and uh, uh, we will let you, I will read your question or I will let you uh, speak <laughs> directly to our speaker. So checking. I have a quick kind of peripheral questions for you, but I, I would like to first see if someone in the audience wants to speak. Um, it's early in the morning, perhaps. So I'll let her go first. So I think you can uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. I don't think I have a raise my hand function as one of the, the co-hosts. Uh, but anyway, my question, thank you for that. I was wondering, you mentioned at the end, right, this you're holding the, the replica in your hand, which made my heart drop for a second. So, oh my gosh, not the real one. No. Sorry. Um, just kidding. Um, but I was wondering, um, how common, or are there other comprehend of those similar type of um, mini treaties or something that um, are in gold or do these not exist? Uh, gold, no. Um, epitomes, which is to say um, variants of text where we know there's a longer version, um, yes. Um, uh, Hand-sized or pocket-sized, we might say, um, no. Um, the, the, the best comparison for something that could be considered a 
personal copy and I am I am I lean towards making this a personal copy if it's a dedication um, it really should have mounting holes um, but there are examples of uh, if you start trolling through looking through um, bronze um, pedimental inscriptions um, uh, expressing honors by a city for an individual um, they're usually larger uh, they do have mounting holes um, but um, uh, they they could be dedicated just like with crowns honorary crowns they could be dedicated by the individual in some civic or religious space or combination there of, the, of the two um, but there are examples from South Italy Greek Greek South Italy uh, and Sicily um, specifically addressing that this is a copy not to be dedicated at a shrine or in a civic place but for the individual um, so it's that kind of um, uh, example that I'm trying to glom onto, if you will. But in short, Comparanda is really limited um, uh, for something of this character. Uh, for stone inscriptions, um, uh, treaties, there are shorter versions, which say just have the oaths um, and don't have all the prefatory material, which is in long versions normal. So those kinds of examples we can find, but not in gold and not um, sort of this, this handheld version. Thank you. There is a question from Glenn Berg. Uh, since Robinson began digging at Olensis in the spring of 1928, with this narrow time parameters of when he acquired the gold tablet. Yeah. Um, trying to put time frames on um, Robinson about anything is difficult. Um, and I found I, this is exactly the question that, that came to me. You know, we always think of Olynthus. Robinson uh, had started collecting in his, his first inscription he acquired in 1901 before he even wrote his dissertation. Um, and his dissertation, for his dissertation, he traveled to Sinope, um, which was obviously still under Ottoman control um, and um, inv investigated everything at Sinope, but ended up using a lot of inscriptional evidence for his dissertation at Chicago. Um, and he was already collecting things then. Um, and the vast majority of what he collected and um, Dr. Becker, Hillary Becker, who's uh, uh, watching can say much more about this because when she was here, um, um, she did a lot of work with her students on trying to track through the materials to find out what documentation there is of how Robinson collected anything. But the vast majority of what he has, he purchased on the market. Uh, this though, Again, this is a cardboard cutout, this, and, and, and it's not even gold color. Um, if this is coming from some place, Macedon, um, uh, uh, Robinson had long been in that neighborhood, um, well, for decades before Olynthus and after that as well. So, so it, it, it raises questions, but, um, answers are, are, well, to put it nicely, and that was what I was trying to get at with Willis, Willis's comments, um, answers died with Robinson. He seemed to have been very, he, he, he never forgot a thing, but he didn't write those things down. It's, it's very um, frustrating. <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you for this question. I think we will move on to our second speaker. Thanks again, uh, uh, Dr. Cook. And uh, we will uh, turn it now um, to um, our second speaker, um, Mike, Mike Lynn. Um, he is an assistant professor of instruction of, in classics at Temple University. He received his PhD from the State University of New York at Buffalo in uh, 2019, where he completed his dissertation on Temple loans on Vilos. His research centers on financing in sacred institutions. His talk today is entitled Managing Sanctuary Records, the case of the sanctuary of Apollo at Delos. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fisher Bouvet, and thank you to everybody, to the panelists, and for everyone who has decided to drop by and, and see our panel today. So, uh, my study analyzes the published fine spot information for all of the inscribed records related to the management for the sanctuary of Apollo at Delos uh, in order to determine 
whether or not, or to what degree, the find locations for these records are the product of deliberate sanctuary management. Neither Delian decree nor sacred law, uh, nor even the inscribed text of the sanctuary records themselves provide any formal information over whether sanctuary officials were responsible for the placement or management of these records. This talk therefore will interpret these sanctuary records not solely as inscribed documents relating to the sanctuary's financial resources or inventories of the temples contained therein, but as archeological objects managed within sanctuary space. By analyzing the fine spots for these records, I hope to show first that there is strong evidence that the placement of these records in the sanctuary was the result of deliberate choice. And second, the placement of these records had direct historical and religious implications for the audience who would have seen them. For the purposes of this talk, I'll be focusing on records attached to two particular structures, the Porinos Oikos and the Grand Temple of Apollo. Records relating to the management of the sanctuary of Apollo appear around 425 BCE and continue to be produced until around 135 BCE. This stretch of nearly 300 years belongs uh, bridges, excuse me, three separate phases of management of the sanctuary of Apollo. Athenian officials uh, and Fictiones managed the sanctuary from the fifth century until 314 BCE. Elected Delian officials uh, called Hieropoioi managed the sanctuary from 313 to 167 until Athens arrives a second time and receives control over Delos following the end of the Third Macedonian War in 167 BCE. Athenian officials Epimeletai uh, manage the sanctuary. On your right is an example of a uh, sanctuary record. Um, beginning in the Delian period of sanctuary management, records documenting the revenues, expenses, and balance of the sacred treasury, as well as the inventory of temples and other, excuse me, and other buildings within the sanctuary were annually produced. These records, however exhaustive in their documentation, give no clear instruction as to where and how they were to be displayed or managed. Archaeological evidence, however, does provide some guidance as to how these records were displayed. Bases to hold these records within the sanctuary lined the southern edge of the Temple of the Athenians, which is located uh, on the left over here, and also along the northern edge of the Temple of Apollo which is seen on the right over here. Since these uh, bases lined both sides, uh, there's a pathway between the temples and this is, thus is called, this pathway is called the Avenue of the Steli. Coupré drew five marble bases for these uh, inscriptions along the south edge of the Temple of the Athenians, uh, which could hold a total of seven steli. Along the northern edge here of the Grand Temple of Apollo, he recorded seven bases, which could have held a total of 14 inscriptions. This structure shows centralized planning for display, but there are only preserved slots for 21 stelae, with one stele produced each year during dealing, in, deal, during dealing independence, that's over 140 stelae, let alone those produced before dealing independence and those produced after dealing independence. So since the bases themselves do not provide the necessary answer of where records were placed and how they were managed, I turn to the discovery location for these records themselves. This information concerning discovery of steli for these accounts has been gathered from several sources. First and foremost, this collection begins with Homoi's work on the management of the sanctuary during dealing independence. Other sources of information include the excavation publications of Durbach, Durbach and Holya, Durbach and Schulhoff, and Schulhoff himself. These I list in my bibliography, which will be my last slide. Uh, and also these uh, find spots appear in the edited collections of the IG and the ID Inscriptions de Delos, published by Durbach and Coupré. Once the excavation context for all these inscriptions was gathered, I organized them according to the structure uh, to which the excavators assigned or attached them. This would allow me to understand if there were any patterns or groupings for this material. Furthermore, once uh, these inscriptions were organized according to structure, I placed these inscriptions in chronological order in order to determine whether there was any chronological basis for these epigraphical groupings. 
as a reminder, since these records appear beginning around 425 and continue to around 135 BCE, the total number of complete inscriptions and fragments is 535. This number appears high and it does so for a couple of reasons. There are several examples of a single inscription being broken into large fragments scattered around the sanctuary. It would be unfair to say that an inscription like ID 442 has no context. Some part of, parts of it were found outside the sanctuary. Some parts are found near the Temple of Apollo. I decided to count both. Um, yes. So I've divided this number of 535 uh, inscriptions and fragments into three broad categories. Inscriptions uncovered in the sanctuary of Apollo, those which were uncovered outside the sanctuary of Apollo, and those which have no fine spot recorded. A few words on these numbers. 53% of the sacred records, uh, so 285 inscriptions, are recorded without contextual information. Just about 10% are recorded as being discovered outside the sanctuary. This includes several uncovered on the island of Mykonos, and 20 listed as having been uncovered along the shoreline, somewhat of an unhelpful geographical designation when dealing with a small island like Delos. Uh, we will focus in on the 199 inscriptions found within the sanctuary itself. Five locations together are linked to 134 of the 199 inscriptions found in the sanctuary. So that is to say two thirds of sacred records that are documented as having been found in the sanctuary of Apollo are linked to five locations. These locations are the Porinos uh, Oikos, the Neorion uh, Pribilos Wall, the Artemision, the area between the treasuries, and the Grand Temple uh, uh, of Apollo. On the map of the sanctuary, I've highlighted these areas uh, and assigned each of them a letter, and I'm gonna walk through them one by one. Before doing so, uh, a small note, um, the discovery context uh, for these inscriptions, the information relating to the distance and or cardinal direction these inscriptions were found uh, relative to a structure, Sometimes the uh, language is a bit ambiguous. Um, the French have used a wide variety of prepositional phrases to describe this, such as nearby, in the neighborhood of, in the neighborhood around. And so uh, as much as this is um, not the most exact language, I still follow what the excavators say in linking these um, stones to these structures. So let's go through these one by one. The first area around which these inscriptions are grouped is the area of the Porinos Oikos. This structure dates to the sixth century BCE and is recognized as the first purpose-built temple to Apollo on the island. 21 inscriptions were discovered uh, in connection to this structure. The chronological distribution of these inscriptions shows two areas of grouping. Inscriptions at the end of the fourth century in the first quarter of the third century BCE, and after a long drought, a group of inscriptions at the beginning of the second century BCE. Nine out of 21 inscriptions appear in the first 40 years of Delian independence. 12 out of 21, a slight majority of stones, appear from the closing years of Athenian control and the beginning of Delian control over the sanctuary. Moving on, the second area between the Neriana and the Pribilos wall contained 21 sanctuary records. Um, this monument, uh, in earlier scholarship referred to as the Monument of the Bulls, is a monument constructed at the end of the fourth century or early third century BCE, most likely celebrating the victories of Demetrius over Ptolemaic forces. This is the Monument of the Bulls uh, here. The Pribilos wall to the east dates to the middle of the third century BCE. 15 out of 21 inscriptions date to before 250 BCE. 10 of these inscriptions date to the very first half of Delian independence. Only four inscriptions date to a period of 225 or later. The discovery locations, a location of these inscriptions takes on special significance relative to other areas for several reasons. First, this area is rather far away 
from any temple to Apollo or temple to Artemis. Second, no major religious structures lie nearby, either temples or major altars. And third, this area does not really lie at any intersection of major paths. Yes, there is an exit right around here, but the footpaths would not necessarily bring you around the back of the Monument of the Bulls. And so it would not have been subject to heavy foot traffic. Our next area is that of the Artemisian. There are 22 inscriptions associated with the Artemisian. Here I've just highlighted the temple to Artemis, but we would expect some more of the uh, stones to be around uh, this temple. Uh, almost a quarter of these records date to early independence. But, one, uh, but as one approaches the second half of Delian independence, the number of records increases. 12 out of 22 records from the Artemisian date to after 199 BCE. Our fourth area is that of the area known as the area of the treasuries by excavators. A series of four structures radiating in a clockwise fashion from north and east of the Porinos Oikos, uh, right around here, and dating to the first half of the fifth century BCE. 17 inscriptions are associated with this area of the sanctuary. Two date to the first half of Delian independence, while 13 out of 17 date to the period of 224 to after 166. Our last area, the Temple of Apollo, the Grand Temple of uh, Apollo, is the site of the last grouping of sacred records. Construction for this Temple of Apollo, located to the south or to the right of the Porinos Oikos, began in the last quarter of the fifth century BCE and was halted. Instead of finishing this temple, the structure immediately to the left or to the north, the Temple of the Athenians, uh, also referred to as the Temple of the Seven Statues, was constructed. Once Delos received its independence, construction for this temple resumed where it was finished around 280 BCE. There are 53 inscriptions associated with this structure. With the exception of one inscription, the remainder of those securely dated inscriptions are associated with this temple around this time that construction was either ongoing or completed. 38 inscriptions out of 53 date to the second century BCE. Closer inspection though reveals that within this group, 31 out of 53, so 58%, date to the period of 185 BCE and later. So now that we've organized these sacred records, the spatial and chronological distribution of these records reveal some interesting patterns, which uh, we can connect to our knowledge of the sanctuary and its operations. But the numbers of inscriptions we're dealing with are quite small, groups of 20 to 50. So any patterns, um, ideas of patterns do have to be tempered here. First, sacred records are associated with clearly structures, such, uh, sacred structures such as the Artemision and two temples of Apollo. But they're also found associated with areas not directly uh, associated with sacred structures, such as treasuries used for storage, and the area all the way over here, the Neoreum. Not all sacred records are uncovered in one spot, they are not located in one cache, or are they associated once with one specific temple. In addition to which, A is the Porinos Oikos, E is the Grand Temple of Apollo. The Temple to the Athenians in between only has one record associated with it. Interestingly enough. Second, with respect to chronology, the largest number of sacred records from the fourth and early third century is grouped next to the Porinos Oikos. Thus, the oldest sanctuary records, either from the period of Athenian and Fictionic control and in the early, early years of Delian independence, are associated with the Porinos Oikos, the oldest temple of Apollo in the sanctuary. In addition, the Grand Temple of Apollo is the location where the highest number of records from the second and third quarter of the second century are located. Again, to put this in perspective, this is the main structure where records from the end of Delian independence and the beginning of the second period of Athenian control in 166 are located. These two structures of the Porinos Oikos and the Grand Temple are the firmest chronological markers. Records from the area of the Nereon and the Pribilos wall are somewhat distributed through independence. Those from the Artemision lean in favor of the second century BCE, while those uh, from the area of the treasuries dates to 
a period after 225 BCE. It is these first two structures in which I will concentrate the remainder of my remarks. The context for the location of these records of the, from the Oikos and the Grand Temple are not just locations themselves, they are important because it suggests planning and purposeful display and messaging for a public audience. The Grand Temple of Apollo would be the strongest example of this, since 38 records connected to this location span the period of time between Delian independence and the Athenian receipt, uh, receipt of the island after 167, this strongly suggests that the new Athenian administrators of the sanctuary chose to erect these sanctuary records at the Temple of Apollo, alongside those set up by Delian officials during the closing years of Delian independence. Political control of the island and sanctuary management changed hands, but the practice of erecting sacred records uh, did not. Athenian administrators, therefore, may have set up records at this location as an external sign to all who visited that the management and worship of Apollo continued without interruption. When we return to the avenue of the stelae, this parallel grouping of bases takes on new meaning. The relatively high number of inscriptions related to the Temple of Apollo would make sense next to a row of bases set up to hold these records. But a larger question looms. Which administration put them there? Is it the independent Delians showing, uh, showcasing and displaying the records from their new Temple of Apollo? Or is it Athenian officials continuing on with earlier traditions and showing that responsibilities of sanctuary management continued business as usual? The circumstances of erecting sacred records at the Temple of Apollo across the time period of two sanctuary administrations uh, could perhaps also be applied to the records attached to the Poinos Oikos. Let us recall that the records attached to this Temple of Apollo, the earliest in the sanctuary, bridges the time period between Athenian management of the sanctuary, lasting from the fifth century to 314, and into the first generation of Delian control of the sanctuary. The numbers of records at this location are not as robust uh, as those at the Grand Temple of Apollo, very slim 12 inscriptions versus a also slim 38 inscriptions, but the suggestion can be made. Athenian officials may have erected sanctuary records nearby the Porinos Oikos during their tenure of sanctuary management, and when Delos received control over its own sanctuary, officials may have continued to erect records in the same location. Delian officials may have chosen this action to show that the careful management of the sanctuary continued uninterrupted despite the ejection of Athenian officials. In our survey of the location finds of Delian sacred records, we have seen both positive outcomes and limitations to this approach. Our vast corpus of 535 records and fragments was quickly, quickly reduced when assigned to exact structures. The location and chronological information, however, relating to the records discovered at the Porinos Oikos and the Grand Temple of Apollo are the two strongest examples that the sites where sanctuary records were erected were deliberately chosen and displayed. 21 were uncovered in the Oikos, around the Oikos, and 53 at the Grand Temple. The, te um, the archaeological evidence for the steelite bases reinforces this evidence on the ground for deliberate selection of placement. The choice for such locations also bears religious consequences uh, and the projection of successful management may have been a strong motivation for certain locations. More work, however, uh, needs to be done. When we expand the scope of this study to the three other locations where sacred records were discovered, we are challenged with a much more complex picture of record management. The area of the treasuries, although next to the Porinos Oikos, only contains records dating to after 175. The Nereon, the area farthest away from the temples of Apollo, is troublesome because contrary to being an area where uh, of display, this appears to be an area that is quite the opposite, a location near no major avenues, walking paths, or not really close to any major entrances besides course, uh, one right around here. Officials may have had a much more nuanced conception of record administration in understanding these locations together to create a synthetic picture of, of management of sanctuary records is therefore necessary. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Um, so once again, we will uh, have time for questions. So just write question or write your question, type your questions in the chat um, and um, we can learn more about Delos. I'm checking if there's any hands. So is there um, oh, someone with a question? Um, please, Regina Lohr, um, you can speak and then we'll have a second question. So uh, thank you. Um, thank you for that presentation. I was wondering, I don't know if this is outside the scope of this paper, but did you see any continuation even with Roman uh, when the Romans took over this, this uh, care of this sanctuary? That uh, is a great question. Uh, the records die out around 135. The Romans um, do not continue on with this uh, practice of doing these annual types of inscriptions. We know that the Romans, um, there's an example where the Lex Galba is actually written on the back of ID 313, uh, an actual sanctuary record. And so they don't treat the material uh, as in the same way that the that the Greeks do. Um, but they also take measures to remove the um, the treasury of Apollo and ship it to Rome. And so I think that's they they treat the the property. Um, not to say they steal everything. That is not true. But they 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 treat it a little bit differently. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Chris Maria Williamson. Uh, thank you. I'm wondering if you could say something about the nature of the inscriptions in each place. The nature as in the composition or the... Um, hi, yes. Um, no, it was like more if there's a relationship between, um, let's say, um, honorific inscriptions in particular places or archives or records or other, other sorts of uh, um, a correlation between um, the message that, that, that was being on display and, uh, and the place where it was being displayed. And, and again, uh, I'm, 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 I missed the first part of your talk, so perhaps you discussed this already. If so, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh no, that's 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 quite all right. Um, there is um, for the uh, avenue of the of the Stelae itself. Um, it was at a bit of an intersection between the north south sort of uh, path through the sanctuary, and so it was also a, a, a way to get folks from the east to the west side of the sanctuary. Uh, in terms of other objects found near these uh, sanctuary records. Uh, I know that the, the Grand Temple of Apollo became uh, a major focus of, um, or a, a focus of Roman dedication uh, at, at a later time. And so this is where we have uh, some dedications by the Imperial family or Augustus. And what's interesting to me is perhaps that there is a connection between uh, the stelae recording the sanctuary records, and if they were found nearby um, dedications uh, set up by um, Augustus or Agrippa. And so the, the practice of uh, setting up these records stopped in 135, but I'm wondering if in order to sort of capitalize on this long history of sanctuary management and Augustus's own connection to the god Apollo if you try to locate his dedications near some of these sacred records to sort of take advantage of this long history of management and patronage to, um, to the gods. Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, we have a question from G. 
question of us today. Uh, brilliant on messaging. Thanks, but would you be willing to say how much actual reading would be required to get the messages? The we know that the um, these inscriptions were set up to be looked at and consulted. Um, we know that the there's a difference uh, in the size of the lettering for uh, final tabulations for financial account amounts. We know that I think ID 443, there's a few inscriptions that have uh, red paint in there. Um, so these things are supposed to be read and consulted. Um, and so these inscriptions really do ride the line between uh, external symbol, but also they were actively meant to be consulted. So they were, some of them were over two meters tall. Uh, and so they would be somewhat impossible to read the entire thing. But we do know that there is a, a legal mechanism called pseudograph A, where if somebody found a mistake or if somebody missed, uh, if there was a, an amount that was incorrect on the stones, you could actually uh, file a legal suit to have that corrected and somebody else would have to pay the fine who entered in the amount or recorded the amount incorrectly. And so this is this is something that is needs more work um, on it. And so that's that's a great that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, there are two more questions I will take uh, here uh, from Patricia Butts. Uh, the stele basis on the south side of the temple of the Athenians versus the ones on the north side of the great temple. How do they relate to each other in the divisions you've made? This is a this is a great uh, question because the bases on the south side of the Temple of the Athenians, clearly they were steely set up, uh, but the French excavators only um, attach inscriptions to the Grand Temple of Apollo. And so this, I think, gets into a little bit of the ambiguity of the language uh, when describing where the, some of these stele were found. Two of them were found on the avenue of the stele, but the excavators say, I believe, they're found on the avenue of the stele, but they connect them with the Grand Temple of Apollo. So it could be the case of the decision of the excavators to just attach um, as a default mechanism uh, the stele to the te Grand Temple of Apollo. That I'm not sure about, and that would be, require going into um, probably the excavation notebooks and the original uh, notes for the excavators. Um, that is a that is a good question, and I do not have a um, I do not have a, a good solid uh, answer for that. I think it's going to take more research. Thank you. And the last question. Um, thank you for this great paper. Um, the basis of for the stones were all these four reports. Could any of the or still is for say civic decrees, is it possible to tell from their dimensions? That is a good question. Here I am following, um, I am following in the, in the footsteps of uh, Shankowski, who identifies them as for the uh, sanctuary records. And I am going on her experience and her vast knowledge of the sanctuary. I would expect if they were for if these bases were for civic honors or for something else, there would be some sort of inscription perhaps on the front of them that would identify them as such. Um, but there is this, the centralized, uh, they appear to, this appears to be a centralized organized uh, attempt um, to make it sort of a, a pathway. And so I think there's a, a, an element of, um, centralized organization, which means it might be for a particular purpose in mind, as opposed to sort of ad hoc um, statues or honors along uh, that pathway. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, to our speaker, uh, thank you, Dr. McLean. We will now move to our third speaker, um, Dr. Mason, uh, who's an associate professor emeritus at the University of Toronto he taught from 1968 after he received his PhD from Harvard until he retired in 2011. He has been studying Lesbos since his first visit there in the early 70s 
and has written, as you certainly know, numerous articles on Lesbos. And the papers you will hear today, and it's pre-recorded, and for which you should also have a handout, it's handout number one, is entitled Lesbian Dialect and the Roman Elite, Julia Balbilla and Neos Theophranes. It began as a seminar presentation on Aeolic dialect in John Franklin, Franklin's class, Ancient Lesbos at the University of Vermont in December 2019. And as Dr. Mason mentioned, it was then still possible to travel and be a guest lecturer uh, in person. But today we can listen to him uh, um, in a pre-video recording. So let's go. The Aeolic dialect is attested in the Roman period in two different spheres, poetry modeled on Sappho and inscriptions from Lesbos and nearby, especially Mytilene. The principal examples of Aeolic poetry in the Roman period are one, Milino's Ode to Rome in Sapphic stanzas, quoted by Stobius and probably from the Republican era since no emperor is named, and two, Four epigrams by Julia Balbilla, the companion of Hadrian's wife Sabina, inscribed on the Colossus of Memnon in Egyptian Thebes in 130. On her father's side, Balbilla was the granddaughter of the last king of Commagene. Her maternal ancestors, Drusillus and Balbillus, were closely associated with the emperors Tiberius and Claudius. They were probably from Alexandria. Her brother was Philopappus of the monument in Athens. Here is her family tree. Her brother Philopappus was consul in 109. Since the consulate was usually achieved in one's forties, he was probably born about 65. If Balbella was the younger sibling, she might have been born around 70. In 136, she dedicated a memorial in Sparta to her cousin, Eurycles Herculanus. Mytilene used the Aeolic dialect consistently until the fourth century. Koine starts to appear in the third century. There are few inscriptions in any dialect between 150 and 70. This may be due to the damages that Mytilene sustained during the sieges of 82-81. Pompey restored independence to Mytilene in 62 as a favour to his Mytilenean associate, Gnaeus Pompeius Theophanes. Theophanes, who was Pompey's praefectus fabrum, wrote a history of his, his accomplishments. Ardo observes a resurgence in the use of Aeolic after 62 as an ornamental written language. Most dialect inscriptions from this resurgence are dedications to individuals, both Roman and Mytilenean. Many are decreed by the Damos and Valla of Mytilene. Note that these institutions are named in dialect. Coins issued by Mytilene in the Antonine period have images of Sappho and Pittacus. The spellings of their names with C and B are those used in our texts of Sappho and Alcaeus. First in individuals honoured with dialect inscriptions after 62 are Pompey and Theophanes. Theophanes is honoured not only for obtaining Mytilene's independence, but also for the restoration of its cults. Strabo's observation that he ten patrida et cosmese suggests contributions to its physical structure. That's in the next slide in handout one. Dedications in dialect to Romans and distinguished locals continue until the third century. There's little evidence about dialect after 300, but some modern place names show Aeolic recessive accentuation. So Yera for Hiera, Therma for Therma. Italy's official use of dialect cannot be separated from the linguistic preferences of the local elite who served as its magistrates and priests. Theophanes, who was responsible for the restoration of Mytilene's civic institutions after 62, will also have been instrumental in its renewed use of dialect. Marcus Pompeius Macrinus, 
Consulin 115 is described in a dialect inscription as the descendant of Hugonos of the first Theophanes, probably his great great grandfather of the family tree. See the next slide and hand out two. His title, Neos Theophanes, which is attested in other inscriptions, was probably given to him by Mytilene. It reflected how much his career resembled that of his ancestor. Each was acclaimed by Mytilene as its Awagetas, Ktistas, and Soter. The inscription, which is on handout three, this is his Roman Cursus Honorum, along with his activities in and for Mytilene. Dialect features in the inscription include Aeronomas for Hieronomas, Epigonos with Ypsilon, Armeon for Hermon, second declension genitives in Omega, and the Greek word for Propraetore, Antistrotagos, written with Omicron. Based on the date of his consulate, Theophanes was probably born in the 70s. His early official positions required his presence in Rome in the 90s and 100s. Since his post propraetore are dated 110 to 114, he was probably praetor in 109. He was legate of the legion in 110, governor of Cilicia until 113, proconsul of Sicily in 114, and suffolk consul in Rome in October 115. His last official post was proconsul of Africa in 131. He represented Mytilene in embassies to Antoninus Pius, most likely in connection with an earthquake which devastated Mytilene in 149. Our inscription is very likely a memorial after his death. It's called Macrinos Heros, implying that he was dead in an inscription found near Rome, which may be dated as late as 170. Albilla's poems, which are in handout four on the following slides, are discussed by Patricia Rosenmeyer in an article from 2008. Besides her sapphic voice, Albilla projects herself as pious, royal, and learned, like her grandparents who are mentioned in poem two. René Audot, the expert on Eolic dialect, asserts that her poetry owes nothing to epigraphical documents. Albilla's vocabulary and grammar may not have been affected by lesbian inscriptions, but I suggest, one, that her decision to write in Eolic was influenced by its contemporary use in Mytilene, and two, that she became aware of Mytilene's linguistic practice through its most distinguished citizen, Neos Theophane. Mytilene also issued coins naming more recent figures than Sappho. They include the first Theophanes and his wife Achidamis, who are called gods. Their cult is also recorded in an inscription and noted by Tacitus. Now the coins, they are in the same style as those of Sappho and Pittacus, which are dated to the second century. I suggest that Neos Theophanes played a leading role in issuing them. Balbella and Theophanes were close in age, reached the peak of their careers in the 130s, belonged to the same narrow and elevated social class, were distantly related by marriage, and had many opportunities to become acquainted. Both had ancestors in the court of Tiberius, Strabo, called Pompeius Macaire, the, first, the son of the first Theophanes, among the first friends of Tiberius. Albilla's great-grandfather Priscillus was his astrologer and closest advisor. Albilla and Theophanes were related through marriages into the Euroclid dynasty in Sparta. Pompeia Macrina, probably his great-aunt, married Gaius Julius Argolicus. Her aunt, Julia, married Gaius Julius Laco probably Argolicus's nephew. Since Euroclid family included several Gai Iuli Lacones, we cannot determine whether the one whom Balbilla's aunt married was the brother or the nephew of Argolicus. 
Pompeius Macrinus' brother, the praetor Quintus Pompeius Macrinus, took his own life in 33 when faced with Damnatio by Tiberius. Unclear if the praetor had a son or a brother who survived the events of 33, or if Gnaeus Theophanes traced his ancestry through a child of Pompeia Macrina. There may have been another generation between the praetor and Gnaeus Theophanes. See the next slide and hand out two. Gnaeus Theophanes is the prime example of high status Greeks with senatorial careers in the second century. Ties of marriage and adoption linked not only Mytilene, Commagene and Sparta, but also Corinth and Athens, represented by Herodes Atticus and many Greek cities in Asia in what has been termed a network of cousinhood. The senatorial cousins held citizenship rights, owned extensive properties, and were generous benefactors in several cities other than their own. A dedication from Tegia shows that Theophanes had property and special status in that city. Albella probably came to know Theophanes through her brother Philippapus, who was consul in 109. She will have had a part in the construction of his memorial in Athens. Trajan's titles in the inscription date it between 114 and 116. Albella most likely became Sabina's companion in 109, when she will have accompanied Philippapus to Rome for his consulate. Adrian was in Rome between his post in Pannonia in 107 and his visit to Athens in 112. 109 is the most likely date for Theophanes' praetorship which required his presence in Rome. Theophanes was in Rome for his consulate in October 115. Adrian was then in Syria, but he was on campaign, so it's likely that Sabina and Belbella stayed home and met Theophanes during his consulate. The Lepapus monument is dated between 114 and 116 by Trajan's titles. Belbella was very likely involved in the creation of the monument Theophanes could have been there after his consulate. He will have been in Italy for the marriage of his daughter Pompeia Agrippinella to Marcus Gavius Squilla Gallicanus from Verona. Since their son Gavius Carthagus was consul in 170, they probably married in the 120s. Theophanes' daughter was honoured with her husband in an inscription from an estate near Rome. Its precise location is unknown, but if the estate was close to Hadrian's villa, then the families of Theophanes and Hadrian could have had many opportunities for social interaction. Gnaeus Theophanes, who was honoured in Tegia after 131, probably had property there. Hadrian was in Tegia for an extended visit late in 124, and Theophanes could have been have entertained him there. He could also have accompanied him to Sparta, where Hadrian probably visited Eurycles Herculanus, a relative of both Balbilla and Theophanes. There's no evidence that Hadrian ever visited Mytilene. In 125, he was in nearby Asia Minor, including Pergamon. Since this was an imperial tour, he would have been accompanied by Sabina and she by Balbilla. It's likely that Mytilene sent a delegation to greet the emperor, led by Theophanes. In 129, Hadrian undertook an extended visit to Greece from Sabina in planning for the Panhellenion, which was established in 131. He entertained delegations from Greek cities. Any delegation from Mytilene would have been led by Theophanes. Theophanes could also have met the court at some point in their progress from Greece to Egypt by Ephesus and Syria. Many of the senatorial cousins played a role in the intellectual life of the second century. Philippapus and Herculanus, Elbilla's brother and cousin, both appear in Plutarch. This is the peak period of promotion of a renewed Attic. Note the story of a meeting of Herodes Atticus with an alleged native speaker of perfect classical Attic. Arian, used a recreated Herodotean Ionic dialect in his Indica. 
He had a very similar career to the Neos Theophanes, including governor of Cilicia, and was called Neos Xenophon. The first Theophanes was a writer as well as a public figure. I wonder if the consul of 115 emulated his historian ancestor by also combining literary pursuits with public life, as Arian did a few years later. At a time when his peers were employing Attic and Ionic based on classical models, Neos Theophanes is highly plausible as the chief promoter of a renewed eology. In creating a persona as a learned female poet, Balbilla was influenced not only by Sappho, but also by the archaizing trends of her social and intellectual circles. I propose that she was influenced in her choice to use lesbian dialect by her relative Neos Theophanes, whom she had many opportunities to meet in both Greece and Italy, and who, I believe, was an active proponent of all things Mytilenean, including the revived use of Eolic dialect. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mason. I think that um, we will be ready to answer two questions. So please, once again, um, write in the chat or uh, just write questions. I'm, and I'll... I'm just unmuting myself. Yes, perfect. While people are uh, writing questions, a very quick, quick question about he. Your first um, title of um, Ptistas, is that connected to the earthquake or um, how is it that he, he had this title of, uh, this honorific title of founder? Sorry, I did. I, maybe, is there an inscription where he is honored as a Ptistas, as a founder? Yes, yes. Several inscriptions where, in which that is used, yes. Um, I don't have the references with me here, but yes. It's connected to the... Ktistes, and again in dialect, Ktistas and Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have a question here from Anna Golam. Thank you for this paper. In your interpretation, then, what should do with uh, po the poetry of Claudia Damo on the same monument and inscribed at the same time, also in the lesbian dialect. It seems more likely that this was the ethos of female poetry in the Roman Empire. And indeed, uh, um, Patricia Rosenmeyer has, has since published a book on the monument in which she argues as much. So Damo is an issue because we don't have any other um, records of who she is. Um, the name is in the typical form of um, a person self-presenting as, uh, as lesbian. It's a, it's a lesbian form name. Uh, I don't know. We have no, we can't say anything much more about her. Um, I'm exploring her possible relationship to the other important family in Mytilene, the descendants of Potamo. Uh, the Lesbonax um, and several people in that line, who also used dialect into the second century, seeing if I can tie her to that family. But um, yes, I I was concentrating on Balbilla. I'm very aware of the issues with Damo, and I don't have an answer yet. Sorry, sorry, I couldn't quite hear you because were you allowing me to speak? I can hear you. Okay, sorry. I um Christelle's a bit a bit soft. Um thank you for for uh, that paper um and for making clear the multiple connections between Theophanes and Julia Balbilla. I love this idea of a network of senatorial cousins. And um, again, I think my approach was, um, I think our approaches are complementary. Um, 
I'm, I'm curious about um, the use of Eolic. Uh, can we separate that? I'm just wondering about Alcius, right? So we were talking about Eolic versus say, uh, what Hannah brought up with a, kind of a female centered use of the lesbian dialect. Um, is there a way to incorporate kind of both approaches um, that, that we can use these networks, but also not lose sight of um, the idea that there's something gendered about this? Is, is that too far from your approach or, or, or could you speak to that well, a bit? No, I'm not too far from that approach at all. Um, I, I recognize that there's a possibility that the active agent in all of these events was not uh, Theophanes, but his daughter, Pompeia Agrippinella, who I assume is the person who is responsible, with her brother, is responsible for the dedication in Mytilene. Um, I'm tracing the relationship between him and his very important political role. He's the only one of the um, people of the, he's the highest status Greek who'd had positions in Rome. He's the only one of very few who reached the consulate and had, held a, had a full career. But it's quite possible, I could entertain the possibility that Pompeia Agrippinella, who's honored in that wonderful inscription from somewhere near Rome as priestess of a cult of Dionysus, that she's the active agent, um, both in honoring her father as all these wonderful things. And you now she, she would have been alive at the same time as Julia Balbilla. I can trace him. I can't trace her other than her being named in Mytilene along with her family as saviors of the city and that inscription. Um, the other thing I don't know about that inscription uh, we can't date it. It's he's dead, so I think it's after 170. But that's circular. The people who said it's 170 are saying that because <laughs> he was probably dead by that time. You know that argument is circular, mm -hmm. but it's quite possible that it's that it's gendered. Um, the only uses of Eolic dialect in the second by this period are women writing poetry and officials in officials in Mytilene. And a few, it's there are a few people in Arasos and other places, but it's so heavily Mytilene. It's not Arasos which is as connected with Sappho as Mytilene is in the later history, wherever she was actually living. Uh, she's not mentioned in Arasos. There are still a few inscriptions from Arasos, but that just may be that we got more there's been more excavation in Mytilene than Eros, Erosos. So I'm, I'm open to gendering, yes. Could, could I ask one very small question? Yes. Thanks. Um, you started with Melino, and I was curious, uh, you know, in weighing Sapphic stanza with Sapphic or Eolic dialect, um, do you think that stanzaic uh, connection can can more be made of that because I know later on, especially in um, uh, Christian poetry and Byzantine material, there's a lot with these specific stanza, but not dialect. Yeah. I, I I I I have no way of dealing with that. Um, I was stressing more than the fact that she chose to do it in Sapphic stanza. There are very few specifically eolic features of her dialect. She could be in Locrian and, and, and following um, Erino and other people who, who use Locrian. It's, she's not very specifically eolic um, as Balbilla is. Uh, the other, but the other thing is that Balbilla is writing in um, Epigrammic, epigrammatic style, which Sappho is not noted for. Mm -hmm. uh, Alcius is, but Sappho is not. And mm -hmm. um, again, I, yeah. I, I, I have my um, 
lesbian hat on, my Mytilenean hat on, rather than my gender studies hat on in looking at all of this, or my study of poetry. Um, I'm not to, really not, inter not interested. I have no particular knowledge of the bibliography on many of these issues. Really, I just wanted to bring um, Theophanes and his family into the discussion. And Thanks. certainly, and certainly Damo or whoever she is. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. If there is no other questions, uh, I think um, we will um, move to our fourth speaker. Uh, so, um, uh, Deborah Sokolovsky is a PhD candidate in classical studies at Columbia University. Her dissertation focuses on the cultures of rural communities in Bithynia during the imperial, uh, Roman imperial period. Using epigraphic and archaeological evidence, her research attempts to elucidate cultural interactions between rural and urban actor actors and how these dynamics responded to the increased presence of Rome and the emperors. So I should um, note that you may want to download the handout number three on the website. The paper is entitled Sebasto in the countryside praying for imperial success in rural Bithynia. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fisher Beauvais, um, and thank you to the other speakers so far, and to everyone joining us virtually from wherever you are, whatever time zone you may be in, on this last day of um, what, have been, uh, what has been a really great um, conference virtually. So yes, my paper today considers two votive inscriptions from rural sanctuaries of Zeus in Bithynia from the 2nd and 3rd centuries CE. Located in today's northwestern Turkey, the former kingdom of Bithynia was annexed by the Roman Empire in the middle of the first century BCE and was joined together with the neighboring kingdom of Pontus to form a single province. We know a great deal about local politics in Bithynian cities under Roman rule, especially Prusa, thanks to the survival of two literary works, Pliny's Book of Letters to the Emperor Trajan, when he served there as governor in 110 CE, as well as the orations of Dio Chrysostom, a local politician and native of Prusa, who was Pliny's contemporary. In part due to the richness of these texts, cultural histories of this region have largely focused on politics within and among cities. However, rural settlements dominated the landscape here, and inhabitants of these settlements, including villages, estates, and even shrines, constantly interacted with those of cities. Moreover, there is a robust epigraphic habit across this region, which invites us to consider how power, pow power dynamics of the polis, so well documented by Pliny and Dio, played out beyond city limits. So in my limited time this morning, I will provide a critical analysis of two texts, both prayers made on behalf of Roman emperors as test studies for considering how power was asserted and in local contexts. Though physically distant, the figure of the emperor was nevertheless pervasive and present, and present in local culture. And by praying for his success, individuals not only reaffirmed existing social hierarchies within their communities in relation to him, but they also attempted to carve out new ones. The earliest of these two inscriptions comes from the sanctuary of Zeus Kersulos. Located approximately 40, 40 kilometers south of Prusa in the foothills of Mount Olympus. It stood on the highest hill in its vicinity, which offered 360 degree unobstructed views of the mountain to its north. While there is evidence for other shrines in these hills, the sanctuary of Zeus Kersulos was by far the largest and the most important, as can, by seen, as can be seen by the quantity, quality, and geographic spread of its remains. This area was part of the craggy border zone between the provinces of Bithynia at Pontus and Asia, which were both separated by the Rindaklos River. The river, whose valley is quite steep and difficult to traverse, also separated the sanctuary from the city of Hadrianoi in Mysia, 
which was founded by the Emperor Hadrian in 131 or 132 CE. However, the sanctuary predated the city's foundation by at least two centuries. There's little evidence for human habitation in this area prior to the foundation of Hadrianoi, and it may have been precisely this remoteness that made the area an ideal place for a cult site. One of the securely pre-Hadrianic dedications from the sanctuary, dated to 113 or 114 CE, was a marble column, which two brothers had purchased and engraved with the following text. This is item number one on the handout. And as you'll see, if you've downloaded it, I have both the Greek text and the English translations for all of the um, text I'll be commenting on. But for the sake of the presentation, the English will not be in the, uh, on the PowerPoint. So according to this dating formula, which is typical in the epigraphy of both rural and urban Bithynia, the brothers made their dedication during the second decade of the reign of Trajan. Considering Trajan's epithets here, he is Dacicus, but not yet Optimus or Parthicus. This must date to the late fall or winter of 113 or 114 CE, coinciding with the emperor's departure from Rome for the Parthian War in October of 113. The phrase kata epitagain, according to a divine command, was typical among the, dedic the dedicatory texts here. Along with the names of prophets preserved in several other inscriptions from the same sanctuary, this shows that this was an oracular sanctuary where visitors consulted the god through an intermediary about actions that they should take. We are otherwise left in the dark about questions posed here, but in this case, the inscription specifies the nature of the brother's question. It was made, huper tes kaisaros nikes, concerning the victory of Caesar. Thus, it appears that the dedicators, Asclepiades and Papas, the sons of Papas, had visited the oracle to inquire about the outcome of the Parthian War, perhaps asking what they could do to ensure Trajan's victory. But the text does not provide any further information about the brothers or any personal connection which they had to the emperor or to the army. They do not identify themselves as Roman citizens, as they are lacking the trianomena in the text, but they do state that they are citizens of the city of Prusa. Whether or not the brothers had a personal connection to Trajan or to the Parthian campaign, what is clear is that they at least wish to portray themselves as having loyalist claims to him. That this is the only inscription from the sanctuary in which the nature of the inquiry is mentioned shows that this was something the brothers wanted to highlight. A personal connection with the emperor was far from impossible for a citizen of Prusa. Dio Chrysostom, who was living in Prusa at the same time that this dedication was made, recounts in several of his orations how his personal relationship with Trajan caused tremendous jealousy among his fellow Prusans. This is item number two on your handout. So in this, in this speech, Dio says, I did not employ that opportunity or good, the goodwill of the emperor for any selfish purpose, not even to a limited degree, but anything that it was possible to obtain, I turned in your direction and I had eyes only for the welfare of the city. In another speech, Dio lambasted some of his fellow Prusans who, after going on an embassy to Trajan in Rome, returned home complaining that the emperor did not pay them enough personal attention. This is item number three in your handout. They claimed that Trajan was not glad to receive your envoys, but was vexed as if it were incumbent upon him to meet them at the gate and there embrace all arrivals or to speak the names of those who had not yet arrived, or to inquire about this one and that one, wanting to know how they were or why they had not all come. So clearly a perceived connection with the emperor was a highly coveted social prize in Prusa. But why would the brothers choose to make such a statement of devotion in the remote foothills of Olympus, so far away from not only Prusa, but any city? In fact, it is not clear to whose civic territory, if any, this sanctuary and its environs belonged. In addition to the temple proper, we know that an odeon or concert hall was also part of the temple complex and that it was donated by a citizen of the small city of Caesarea Germanicae, sometime also in the second century CE. It appears that the city of Caesarea itself also sought to have a special connection with the sanctuary. 
as several of its coins depict Zeus on the reverse, two of which included the monogram Kers and Kerso. This is a very grainy photograph, but it's the best one. And you can see on the left side of Zeus, you have Kappa, Epsilon, Rho in a ligature. And then the other side, there's a very faint, but it is there, Sigma. Moreover, we know that this sanctuary was visited by pilgrims from an array of cities and villages, including the name of one's hometown, as the brothers did, was standard practice in the epigraphic habit of the votives set up here. In addition to the brothers from Prusa and this man from Caesarea, pilgrims are attested from Nicomedia, Phrygian Ankara, as well as from otherwise unattested villages, such as Plane, Ariste, Labo, Mene, Arese. Most of these visitors then were local elites who, though modestly wealthy and successful in their own communities, had little influence outside of the region. The supra-regional sanctuary clearly lay at the crossroads of several overlapping geographies, a liminal space where visitors from across the region came to receive divine guidance. To set up an inscribed votive here meant to advertise one's name beyond the confines of one's polis or one's village. And towards the wider populations of Bithynia, Mysia, and Phrygia. It played an intermediary role in the wider networks of power and nexus which connected cities and villages alike. As described in the orations of Dio, one way that Prusians asserted political influence in this period was in relation to the Roman emperor. The brothers' dedication can be understood in a similar way. By praying for victory against Parthia, they sought to enhance their status on a supra-regional stage, tapping into a wider network of regional power. In contrast, the second inscription takes us inside the politics of a village community. It comes from the Pazar Yeri Plain, some 70 kilometers southeast of Prusa. This plain was enclosed in a fertile valley by the Domanich Mountains, which delineated Bithynia from Phrygia. And in contrast to the foothills of Olympus, this area appears to have been home to at least two, if not more, large village settlements called Pronaya and Dabla. Together, the settlements formed a larger community, a dicomia or double village, well attested throughout Roman Asia Minor. The road running east-west from Prusa to Dorylion passed through here, as did a minor road joining it to Nicaea and Juliopolis. Thus, these two village settlements were well positioned on trade routes and likely saw a high volume of traffic. When Senjar Shaheen first visited this site in the 1970s, he found countless ancient stones, as well as the walls of a building in Ashlar masonry, likely a temple of Zeus which still remain in situ. A recent survey conducted here by Hussein Sami Austurk has revealed that the site is still full of ancient materials, therefore making it a rare and ideal case study for a village temple. It was at this temple where, in the summer of 210 CE, a certain Krestos dedicated a marble bomos or altar to Zeus Benios on behalf of the well-being of the emperors Septimius Severus Caracalla and Geta. This inscription is item number four on the handout. A short timeline for this family of father-son emperors may be useful as it was marked by uh, often internal conflict and sudden change. For as we know, the family's control of the empire began with Septimius Severus, who became emperor in 193 CE after a series of civil wars following the infamous year of the five emperors. In 198, he elevated his older son, Caracalla, to rule as his co-emperor. 10 years later, Septimius Severus further solidified his family's grasp on power by elevating his younger son, Geta, to co-emperor as well. However, the death of Septimius Severus in February 211 spelled trouble for the Severan stability. For nearly two years later, Caracalla ordered his younger brother's assassination in 212 followed by an erasure of his name and image across the empire as part of what we would now call a damnatio memoriae, damnation of his memory, perhaps best evidenced by the so-called Berlin Tondo for Egypt, seen here on the right. And as we can see, Geta unfortunately has been erased beyond a doubt in this image, uh, or rather his face has been erased. 
Now, looking back at our inscription, the typical Bithynian formula, dating formula was once again used. So we know that the dedication was made in the 18th year of the reign of these three emperors. So that would be 210 CE. That Geta's name has been erased from the inscription sometime after his assassination in 212 shows that the temple, the village and or Krestos, the dedicator was well attuned to the politics of the imperial court as we see in countless examples, including the Berlin Tondo. But since the text was also dated to the Bithynian month Areos, um, so after, which is June or July, so after Geta's promotion to co-emperor in the autumn of 209, but before Septimius Severus's death in February of 211, this dedication was likely made as part of a one-off celebration in honor of the new emperor Geta's ascension. This was expressed in the text by the general prayer, who per soterios ton autocraton, for the well-being of the emperors. However, the emperors were not the only recipients of prayer in this instance. As we find, it was also made, who per soterios ke carpon teis comes, on behalf of the well-being of the crops of the village. Anxiety over agricultural affairs is well attested throughout the empire, and prayers for a good harvest are especially common in the religious epigraphy of Roman Asia Minor, especially in rural Phrygia, Mysia, and Bithynia. And in fact, this phrase, hu per soterias carpon, appears in five other dedicatory inscriptions from the Pazarieri plain alone. And so it appears to have been a particularly common feature of cult practice here. As with the previous inscription, Krestos did not identify himself as a Roman citizen, nor a citizen of any city for that matter. He is Krestos Glyconos of the family or the clan of Krestos Dagus. This exact onomastic formula with Genos is unattested, but it's likely that we're dealing here with a father and a son who share the same first name and are therefore also called by second names or nicknames. These sorts of double names are attested in other inscriptions from the plain. Moreover, Krestos was a very popular name in Bithynia and Roman Asia Minor more generally. So it's perhaps not surprising that the individual here wished to make a distinction. But the name Dagus, however, is extremely rare. And it appears only once in one other inscription, also from Bithynia, in an epitaph found approximately 70 kilometers north of here which was dated to the second or the third century CE. So more possibly at the same time or similar to this inscription. Especially since at this time, Romanizing names were very popular in both rural and urban Bithynia. And in fact, at this specific temple, it is interesting that Krestos's father was still called by a Bithynian name. Theirs must be an old local family with significant land holding in the area and with direct access to oxen and wine. For as we find out in the following lines, in addition to this inscribed bomos and statue atop it, which actually was a particular votive type specific to this precise region of Bithynia and Phrygia, as has been shown very briefly, we don't have time to go into it, but you can see clearly it's the altar with this particular type of bust of Zeus on top. Um, so Krestos donated this, very typical of the region. And in addition to this, he donated all the proper accoutrements for a traditional Greek sacrifice. That is, he gave an oxen sacrifice, a buthusia, um, and everything that goes along with it, ta pros alta, which of course assumes that a casual viewer of this knows what a buthusia or oxen sacrifice usually entails. Uh, he also gave perfumed oil, mura, as well as wreaths, stephanoi, as well as uh, five metritai of wine, winos, which is equivalent roughly to 197 liters of wine, as well as a bronze serving vessel, a calcoma, presumably for this wine. All of these gifts would have made for a sumptuous sacrifice, presumably followed by a large communal meal shared by the inhabitants of this village. In addition to the prestige it brought Krestros's family, such an occasion provided the village community access to the fruits of their labors, that is wine and meat. But the text then shifts using the emphatic particle mentu, read mentoi, however, to warn that the bronze vessel is 
anexodiaston ke anupothekon, unsellable and not to be given as a pledge. This vessel, the Kalkuma, would have been inscribed or marked in some way to indicate that it belonged to our dedicator, Krestos, and his family, thereby advertising his goodwill to the community during this celebration, as well as every time it was reused again in the future. We know that temple treasuries could sometimes be used to raise revenue when temple funds were low, and it seems that this is what's being referred to in the prohibitory language. The names of the two komarhoi, or village leaders, though incorrectly written in the singular, komarhontos, is usually meant as an eponymous dating formula. In this context, it also is meant to show that the komarchs have authority over controlling procedures concerning the exploitation of dedications. In our case, it's the bronze vessel in particular that he's concerned about. Although this inscription is the final product of the negotiation between Krestos, the temple, and the village, this warning about the bronze vessel offers a glimpse into local power dynamics. Krestos wanted his gift to remain with the village for other occasions of communal feasting, thereby continually reminding them of his piety to the god and his status in the community. But Krestos clearly also felt some sort of apprehension that compelled him to stipulate that his gift cannot be sold or given away. His donations to the temple and the village community should therefore be viewed as acts of euergotism. That is the system of governance in which elites gave benefactions to their communities in exchange for honors granted by them, which was also marked by a near constant push and pull relationship between the demos and the elites. In fact, there is an honorific decree from the same community dated later in the third century in which a local man was praised for quote, having given oxen, oxen to the decomia. So this is item number five on the handout. And again, we don't have too much time for the sake of the presentation, but I would also point out that this um, donor in this case also was a citizen of the village as well as a centurion of the Roman army as were his ancestors. Um, so clearly a distinguished individual. In this view, the villagers of, in this situation were not mere pawns for the wealthy local families like that of Krestos or the man referred to here, who owned the lands where many of them presumably labored, but in fact, they could wield power over these donations. That local landowning families felt compelled to donate to the village in the first place shows that their power and status depended at least in part on the cooperation and cohesion of the village community. Moreover, the sacrifice paid for by Krestos invited the community to view themselves, if only subconsciously, as part of a Roman oikumene or universe in which the gods looked after the emperors who in turn granted prosperity in their lives. The village's active participation in imperial culture then reflects not only collective local agency, but a culture under, which, under Roman rule in which imperial and agrarian prosperity were aligned. Both the Prusen brothers and Krestos are clear examples of Bithynian landowning local elites who were moderately wealthy and set up dedications on behalf of Roman emperors as a means of reaffirming or magnifying their power in local contexts. Asclepiades and Papas made their dedication on behalf of Trajan at a super regional sanctuary, which attracted pilgrims from across the region, perhaps in an effort to spread their influence beyond the confines of Prusa's civic territory. Similarly, Krestos celebrated Geta's ascension to power at a village temple, which, based on its proximity to well-trafficked regional roads, would be on display for the community, as well as perhaps for travelers passing by. As detailed in the writings of Dio and Pliny, politics and power in Bithynia were driven with a view to Rome and to the emperors. In order to more fully understand how power was achieved and maintained in Bithynia under Roman rule, it is crucial to consider how actions, like prayers for emperors, functioned in both urban and rural settings. Proclaimed proximity to the emperor, whether real or embellished, had real implications in these local power systems. And yet, power is a two-way practice. And these instances also show the dominance that the figure of the emperor had, even in remote corners of the empire. As I have argued, the Sabastoi were invoked in these instances as intermediaries to confer validity and power onto the social position of their dedicators, as well as their place in the wider Roman oikumene. For in the end, 
all Bithynians, regardless of social status, were part of a world in which the emperor reigned supreme. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this very fascinating paper putting to the forefront the, the importance of these rural sanctuaries. So once again, please, um, or if you just join us, uh, you know that you can write your question in the, in the chat or just write questions. Um, maybe while you do that, I'll, I'll just ask a very brief questions as, um, to the, yeah, uh, related to the economic importance of these centers. Do we know anything about their, uh, about fares taking places or exemption of taxes they could receive? We have a fascinating text from Syria uh, that dates from the Seleucid period, but was engraved in the Roman period in, in Batokake because they wanted to show their importance and they, they received azilia and exemptions and so on. Do, do, you have, do you know anything about these temples? Uh, so for both of these temples in particular, unfortunately, of course, no, but uh, in my research, I would argue exactly this because you do find similar inscriptions talking about fairs or at least alluding to taxes and things being sold there. I'm at other village temples in this area. So of course, I, I would just assume that this is exactly what's going on. OK. Thank you. Hmm. OK, I'm just checking if I'm not missing hands up here. Or questions. Well, I, I don't want to monopolize, but I'll ask a very quick second question. I mean, do you have, um, um, I mean, this, I see that in Hellenistic inscription, which you know, I'm more familiar with, uh, where you, you indeed show that you are close to this local person that is really connected to the emperors. And we have also these inscriptions with Hooper, where you know, they do that on behalf of a commander or a garrison commander and for the king and so on. So, I mean, this last inscription that you brought is, is really interesting. Do we have um, other examples or in you know, other sanctuaries? Is it something you see all the time? Or of the um, dedications the centurion was you know showing that someone kind of settled down uh, in this in the area over several generation oh yeah so i think that um right maybe it's not as explicit in other inscriptions as in this one right clearly the reason he's going well actually it's the demos who's who's at length describing the the ancestors um this is probably the most explicit, at least that I'm familiar with in this area, but of course, so-and-so, the son of so-and-so um, is common throughout um, these, these village inscriptions, yeah. And then also I would just add that this idea of so, uh, huper soterios, not only does that actually apply in, in these regions to the emperor, right, but people actually give these huper soterios dedications on behalf of estate owners as well. So really it's the same, you use the same exact language to connect yourself with someone who clearly has more power than you do um, as a way of, I think, reaffirming or magnifying your own um, status in the community or connection with the God even. Okay, we have a question from Xingwen Wu, one of our panelists. Thank you for the paper. It's very interesting. Can anyone dedicate on behalf of the emperor? Should there be any preparations, privileges, or things that people need to do off-site, such as a Sebastian, before they make the dedication? Oh, this is a great question. So thank you for this. I think this gets back to the wider question of right, what, do we, what is imperial cult? Because this has been, of course, hotly debated. And if you ask Simon Price, I think he would say that actually these dedications are not imperial cult because they're not to the emperor. They're on his behalf to another deity, which is actually Zeus. So who can dedicate? It's interesting that in these instances, um, I, who can do this? I'm presuming anyone, because you, again, this is the common epigraphic language that, that's used for all types of dedications. I could dedicate something, who pairs Oterios, on behalf of the safety of my family even. It's not restricted to the emperor, but 
there are a few cases of people dedicating, which seems to be otherwise very rural, not related to a Sebastian in the city, directly to an emperor. Um, so what you have to do before you do that, we're not entirely sure. Um, maybe we could speculate that you would have to visit a site, but I would suspect that, that anyone could do this. Um, at least in these two texts that I'm showing, I think, I think anyone can do this. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there is no other question, we will uh, thank uh, Deborah Sokolovsky once again and, and move on to our next speaker. Thank you. So our next speaker, uh, Dr. Um, John Morgan is professor of physics at the University of Delaware. Besides his publication, Theoretical Chemistry in Atomic and Molecular, Molecular Physics, he has published and given numerous papers in classical studies in the field of Latin poetry, and as you know well, epigraphy, with a focus on chronology and calendars. He has notably been collaborating with Paul Everson on a book on the Antiquera, Antiquitera Mechanisma and the Corinthian family of calendars. His talk today is entitled Hadrian's birthday and the Athenian month Adrianion. Thank you. Please um, share your screen or let me know if you need help. Let me see. I need to, sorry, yeah, I need to, I guess I need to share my screen first before I start my PowerPoint. Is that correct? Um, no, I think you need to open your PowerPoint and then when you yeah. screen, yeah. screen yeah. Okay. you will see it. Yeah, I have opened my PowerPoint and I'm now- Okay, it's coming, I can see it. So now Perfect. you can see that. Okay, good. Okay, good. Um, and I and need you to- can just that. click display. So I think it, it gets a bit bigger for- um, depending Yeah, where's display? Uh, yes, I think that the slideshow, yeah, the usual, the usual starter for slideshow. I think you are on it. Yeah, I'm on it. I need to go back to my first slide, but I don't see how to enlarge it. Maybe over here, maximize. Let's try um, that. Is that better? Uh, yes, I mean, I just uh, starting the slideshow. I think it's a. I, I don't know if you can see what where I'm pointing. I guess not. Yeah, maybe uh, up here. At the bottom. Yeah. yeah perfect. Okay, good. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. So here's my the title page. Um, most classicists know that the months we call July and August are derived from the Roman months Julius and Augustus and that these months, which were originally called Quinctilus and Sextilus, were renamed to honor the recently assassinated Julius Caesar in 44 BC and the still living Imperator Caesar Augustus in 8 BC. Such changes of the names of traditional months to honor deified or quasi-divine rulers had several precedents in the Hellenistic period, which were discussed by Kenneth Scott in 1931 and by the late Christian Habicht in his Habilitation Schrift, which was recently translated into English. In the ancient world, there were two types of calendars. In a lunisolar calendar, the civil months were supposed to correspond closely with the phases of the moon. Since 12 mean lunar months have about 11 fewer days than a solar year, to keep the months roughly aligned with the seasons, it's necessary to insert a 13th month, roughly once every three years, or more exactly, seven times in 19 years. Examples of such lunisolar calendars are the modern and ancient Chinese calendar, the modern and ancient Jewish calendar, which is based on the ancient Babylonian calendar, and most ancient Greek calendars. In contrast, the months of a solar calendar, such as the familiar Julian and Gregorian calendars, usually have no correspondence with the phases of the moon. One example of changing the name of a traditional Macedonian lunar month 
to a name honoring a Hellenistic ruler is Eumenaeus in the calendar of Pergamon, which must have been intended to honor either the first or the second Eumenes who ruled Pergamon. Another example of changing the name of a traditional Greek lunar month to a name honoring a Hellenistic king is Seleucaios in the calendar of Ilion, which is attested by two inscriptions of the Hellenistic period. It was probably intended to honor the first king, Seleucus Nakator, with the name Seleucus. The traditional Macedonian calendar used in the kingdom of Pergamon and after 133 BC in the Roman province of Asia was a lunisolar calendar. In 8 BC, the proconsul Paulus Fabius Maximus suggested that the Greeks of Asia could honor Augustus by adopting a solar calendar in which the first month of the year would begin on Augustus' birthday, ante diem nonum calendas octobres, the 23rd day of September, and each successive month would begin on the ninth day before the calends of a Roman month, the monthly birthday of Augustus. The first month was renamed Caesar, and the first day of each month was called Sebaste, to honor Augustus. Usually, the month renamed to honor a ruler was the month within which he was born. An exception is Augustus as is recorded by Suetonius and Macrobius, who cites the original decree of the Roman Senate, Augustus wanted the month bearing his name to be not the month in which he was born, but the month in which he entered his first consulate and in which he won several famous victories, including his conquest of Egypt in 30 BC and celebrated his triple triumph in 29 BC. The Roman era solar calendar of Smyrna is attested by a Byzantine manuscript in the Bibliotheca Medicea Laurentiana in Florence and by several inscriptions found at Smyrna. It was similar to the solar calendar of the province of Asia, but involved the change from a traditional Ionic rather than Macedonian lunisolar calendar. Its first month was Caesar, which began on the birthday of Caesar Augustus. Its second month was Tiberius in which fell Tiberius' birthday on November 16. In the spring and summer, there were the months Stratonicaeon, which apparently honored Stratonicae, the wife first of Seleucus I, and then his son, Antiochus I, and the mother of Antiochus II and his own wife, Laodicae, after whom the months Antiochaeon and Laodicaeon were named. It was not uncommon for Greek cities in Asia, which in the Hellenistic period had renamed some of their traditional months to honor Seleucid kings and their queens, to rename some of their traditional months to honor Roman emperors. However, most Roman emperors had the good judgment to decline suggestions to rename months of the traditional Roman calendar after themselves. A counterexample was Domitian, who had September, in which he had begun his reign, renamed Germanicus, and October, in which he had been born, renamed Domitianus. In the Damnatio Memoriae, which followed his assassination in 96 AD, most of the occurrences of these names of months were erased from inscriptions. Probably soon after the death and deification of the elder Faustina, the Roman Senate decreed that September, in which the emperor Antoninus Pius had been born, be renamed Antoninus, and the following month be renamed Faustinus, but Antoninus declined these honors. To summarize, renamed Greek and Roman months bearing the names of Roman emperors were usually the months in which they were born. This is the case with Julius, Caesar, Tiberius, Domitianus, and Antoninus. The only exceptions are Augustus, the month in which Augustus had entered his first consulate and won important victories and celebrated his triple triumph, and Germanicus, the month in which Domitian had become emperor. Let's now review the honors which the Athenians bestowed on their patron, the Emperor Hadrian, in 124 to 5 AD, or perhaps a few years later. 
They created a 13th tribe, Hadrianis, and a new dean, Antinoes, to honor his teenage boyfriend and instituted new festivals in their honor. They also gave to the 13th month in an intercalary year, which traditionally had been called a second Posideon, the name Hadrianio. Why did the Athenians honor Hadrian with a month which would recur, not each year, as with all the other renamed months honoring Roman emperors, but only roughly every third year? To answer this question, it's necessary to understand the operation of the traditional Athenian calendar. The new year began with the first new crescent moon after the summer solstice, a theoretical rule mentioned by Plato in his laws for an ideal new Greek city on Crete and confirmed by extensive evidence on Athenian inscriptions from about 350 BC until around 200 AD. This rule automatically induces a 19 year metonic cycle with 12 ordinary years of 12 months and seven intercalary years of 13 months with a slippage of only about two hours in 19 years, which is more accurate than most mechanical clocks. In the middle of the first century BC, Diodorus Siculus wrote that this cycle was used by most of the Greeks. This statement, which until recently had been widely doubted for the city-states in mainland Greece, is confirmed by extensive but widely unappreciated epigraphical evidence from Delphi and by the decipherment of the names of epirote months on the metonic spiral of the Antikythera mechanism. At Athens in the classical period and the first half of the Hellenistic period, various months were doubled to make a year intercalary but in the second half of the Hellenistic period and the Roman period, the intercalary month appears always to have been inserted after Posideon in midwinter, the same position as the intercalary month in the Delphic calendar and in the Epirote calendar on the Antikythera mechanism. Here I show in two columns the order of months in an ordinary Athenian year of 12 months and in an intercalary year of 13 months. You can see these second Posideon occurring in the middle of the winter. Most of the evidence for the operation of the Athenian calendar in the Roman imperial period comes from inscriptions honoring Ephebes, on which the gymnasiarchoi, or who held office in each month, were listed in chronological order beginning with Boe Dromion, the first month of the Ephebic year. On these inscriptions from the first two decades of the second century, you can see the lists of months in an ordinary year and an intercalary year. In the right column, you see the first and second Posideon. Next, on these inscriptions from the middle of the second century, you again see the lists of months in an ordinary year and an intercalary year with the intercalary month now called Hadrianio. There are several such Ephebic inscriptions from roughly after the 130s AD into the early third century of our era. To return to the question of why the Athenians changed to Hadrianio, the name of their intercalary month, rather than one of the usual 12 months of their lunar solar calendar, the examples of other renamed honorary months suggest that Hadrian had been born in the, intercal in the Athenian intercalary month. Various literary and epigraphic sources, including Hadrian's horoscope, which Alex Jones directed my attention, indicate that Hadrian was born in 76 AD at sunrise on January 24, in the middle of the winter. Here's a sketch of the Athenian year, which began shortly after the summer solstice in 75 AD and ended after the summer solstice in 76 AD. The first day of each month called the Numania should have coincided with the first visible new crescent moon. The last day of each month, called the Hene Kainea, old and new, was the day of the conjunction of the moon with the sun, which in modern terminology is called an astronomical new moon. Extensive tables with the computed dates and times of such conjunctions 
and the other principal lunar phases, namely full moons and half moons, from 2000 BC to 400 AD are available on Fred Espinac's AstroPixels website. You can see that Hadrian was born at sunrise on January 24, the last day of the intercalary month in this Athenian year. Although we can't exclude the possibility that for several decades, the Athenians had been keeping track of the correspondences of the days of their lunisolar calendar with the Roman solar calendar, I think it's more likely that the Athenian date corresponding with the Roman date of Hadrian's birth was computed by an expert astrologer in his court, perhaps Antigonus of Nicaea, who had computed the horoscopes of Hadrian's birth and his assumption of the imperial power. Nicaea was one of the capitals of Bithynia, the province where Hadrian had met his boyfriend, Antinous. Using the methods which Hipparchus had developed in the second half of the second century BC, expert astrologers were able to compute accurately, not just the days, but even the hours of ecliptic conjunctions of the moon with the sun, more than 600 years before and after their own times as is confirmed by this marvelous example discussed by Grafton and Swerdlow in this article in Classical Quarterly in 1985, which I recommend. Um, so for an astrologer in the 120s AD, determining the configuration of the moon and the sun on Hadrian's birthday about 50 years earlier would have been straightforward. This review of Greek practice in honoring Hellenistic kings and, re and Roman emperors by renaming months, my analysis of the renaming of the Athenian intercalary month as Hadrianion, prompts some further speculation about why some four centuries earlier, the Athenians honored Demetrius Polyorchetes by renaming Munichion rather than some other month, Demetrion and renaming the Hene Kainea, the last day of their lunar months, the Matrios, as is recorded in later sources based on the testimony of Philochorus, a contemporary of these events. In his commentary on the fragments of Philochorus, Jacobi found, quote, the choice of Munichion difficult to explain. I suggest that Munichion probably was the Athenian month which corresponded with the Macedonian month, in which Demetrius had been born, probably Artemisios, since there's explicit evidence that the next month, Dysios in the Macedonian calendar was normally equated with the Athenian month Targalion. Furthermore, motivated by the fact that the Greeks of Asia called the monthly birthday of Augustus Sebaste, I suggest that the reason why the Athenians renamed the Hene Kainea rather than some other day, Demetrius, is that Demetrius had been born on the last day of a lunar month, specifically the month corresponding to Munichio. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for presenting very clearly this material. Um, so I'm opening the floor to questions in the chat or um, let me know and we'll unmute yourself. Okay, wh while we are waiting for question, just a quick question. Um, for you about um, the fact that it's an um, intercalary month for uh, Adrian and it doesn't come every year. Do you think, I mean, in a sense, he, well, I mean, I, I, I'm completely convinced by what you presented, but in a sense, it's even, he is even capitalizing on the fact that he, it's exceptional. I mean, is that something even better not to be there every year or? Yes, yes, I, I would say it's, it's analogous to the much rarer situation of people who are born on the 29th day of February. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. And we celebrate their true birthday only once every four years. And I should say that the festivals, the Hadrianea and the Antinoea, seem to have been celebrated every year in months which were different from Hadrianio. So this is a seems to be a very unusual example where the the uh, the festivals were not celebrated in the associated months. Okay, I see, and, and they were not every year the same months festivals. Um, well, I guess we don't know. We don't have it. We don't have attestations of. We have only a few attestations of the specific months in which the Hadria and Nea were celebrated. And they seem to be different months, you know, in different decades. Okay, thank you. We have a question here from John Kisling. Uh, very interesting. Do intercalary months have religious festivals on given dates? Uh, good question. I think we don't really know for sure the answer. Uh, I'm most familiar with the evidence from Athens. It is assumed that the monthly festivals for gods and goddesses such as Athena and Poseidon and so on were celebrated in the intercalary month, although we don't actually know that. There is, has been, I think it's usually assumed that the major festivals were celebrated in the usual month rather than the intercalary month. However, there is no proof of that. And I have read, I'm not an expert at all on Babylonian religion, but I have read that, uh, that the festivals in the Babylonian calendar were celebrated in the second month. In other words, in the intercalary month, in intercalary years. And so it's, it's we, we just don't have enough evidence to be sure about what the Athenians were doing and what was being done in other Greek cities. Thank you. Okay, checking if I missed hands. Any other questions? Okay, I think, uh, thank you once again for this talk. Um, very, very, very interesting. Uh, and we will uh, move on to our last uh, speaker for today. Uh, let me find my notes. Um, so our last speaker, Dr. Xingyuan Wu received his PhD from the Ancient History Graduate Group of the University of Pennsylvania in 2018, and is currently assistant professor at uh, Beijing University in the Department of History. Um, his, so it must be very late for you. <laughs> his main research interests include provincial assemblies and provincial elite interactions during the Roman principle. Uh, principle. The, the title of the paper is Counting Victories or Years, the Curious Case of the Sinopean Victory List. Xingyang, I'll let you go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank uh, the conference organizers for making this virtual conference uh, rich and enjoyable. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. fisher Bovet for uh, chairing this panel. Uh, the time right now is 1.20 in the morning. So if I uh, seem a little odd, just forgive me. Uh, the subject today is the victory list from Sinope inscribed on a round cheapest, uh, 0.5 meters high and 2.2 meters in diameter. Uh, documenting the competitions won by a Sinopean boxer. And the texts and translation presented here are from David French's IK Sinope published in 2004. 
And the contents of the inscription can be visualized uh, here. Essentially, what we see is the successful career of the, Sinope of the Sinopean father, Marcus Eutius Marcianus Rufus, across the Mediterranean world. And how many victories did he win? From French's translation, it seems that he had won a total of 150 victories. This number would include both the 110 victories and other competitions of the half past class, and also the is, uh, uh, East Elastic uh, victories listed ad nauseum above. And this is how Christian Merrick's uh, sum summation of this inscription in his recent volume on Asia Minor. So 49 victories in 27 sacred games and 11 other, uh, and 110 other contests. Now, what is interesting is that Patrick Goh, in his dissertation published in 2009, counted 108, uh, 198 victories, the highest ever recorded victor in the Mediterranean world. Uh, the key difference is that Goh does not include the Rho Iota uh, uh, in the uh, Antipatome, uh, in the antipenultimate line, and he did not explain why he deviated from French reading. And another issue related to the count of victories concerned the dating of this inscription. So uh, Go wants to see Marcianus Rufus an boxer. And if we turn back to Merrick, he wants to see him as a Trajanic boxer. It's just ten, a decade. Uh, in between, but interesting. My investigation. Oh, Shang Yun, excuse me for interrupting. There is something, uh, I don't know if with your microphone that uh, maybe you are touching at some point, or I don't know if you can just double check. We hear you, but there is an extra noise. Okay. Uh, it's probably me interacting with my desk, which is not a good pra practice. I'll okay, that sounds much better now. <laughs> Thank I'm you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me just uh, give this another try. And uh, apologies for the noise. Okay, so, uh, right. So where was I? Uh, right. So another issue related to the count of victories concerning the date, and uh, I've talked about how the Hadrianic and the Trajanic seems a little interesting here. And uh, we'll talk about that later. For now, we'll turn to the first three editions of this inscription that were produced by Reinach in 1916, Bean in 1953, and French in 2004. All of these are based on autopsies. And I did a tabulation of the different readings between the lines, and the more minute differences can be presented as such. Now the total number of is elastic uh, of is elastic victories, whether it's Reinach being or French, all exceed forty, and hence would inevitably exceed the number one hundred and fifty when added to the one hundred and ten in the antepenultimate line, and only Bean's count could make it work. But uh, this is based on a series of difficult solutions. First, he need to control the total number of is elastic victories that Marcianus, Marcianus Rufus won. And from the squeeze made by French, it is clear that there's really no way to see the letter that uh, he is talking about here clearly. Uh, we can't really say if it's really B or it's a, it's a beta or an epsilon. So, because, you know, it's, and Bean was able to also introduce another solution, reading a originally smaller Greek numeral alpha under the iota. And from French squeeze, we can barely make out the row and really just very difficult with the iota. So we cannot really say for sure whether Bean actually saw the alpha and we can't really be sure if there's an iota. So I tried, so this is the extent of my Photoshop skills. I tried to use different colors to see if it looks weird. There may be a row and the iota is probably gone, but um, 
we need to ask whether the row and the I that was actually there, considering that both letters were read by Reinach and Bean, the first being a century before this squeeze, and the second being 50 years or so before the squeeze, we may assume that the condition of the stone has deter deteriorated significantly over time, and hence the in invisibility. Uh, in any case, uh, from what the squeeze tells us, uh, French, French texts need at least to dot the row and the iota, which um, perhaps could be uh, improved later on. Now back to the count. Uh, why would Bean want to reconcile the numbers at all? It seems that he had an entrenched assumption. So the rho and nu is surely the total, he says. Uh, Reinach did not make that assumption because his reading mixed up the positions of the rho nu and the rho iota and instead restored Andrianti, he proposed Andrianti or pat Patris, uh, something like that, along the lines of that. Mm. And the question is, should we continue to make the same assumption that the row and the new represents the total number of Rufus victories? Uh, given the damage observable from the squeeze taken by French, there's even more need to take a step back and state this assumption. If the letters rho iota exists, exist, then rho iota must be the total of half talent victories, not rho new, and this would come. This will be uh, against Go's reading. And assuming that rho iota exists, uh, just so whether that they're too faint to see, then we need to ask, what does the letters rho new mean? Because now, it's uh, it's a it's a number that cannot be reconciled by simple arithmetic. So I set up a heuristic test, test using the, a PHI database to see whether there are other victory lists that count the total of as elastic and prize victories. And using, count, and using the contests from Marcianus Rufus's list as counting or providing a summation of um, uh, as, as keywords, I compiled a list of 209 inscriptions. And among these 145 inscriptions show no effort in counting or summing up the number of as elastic or prize victories, but 64 show traits of counting or summing up of victory totals as the example here shows. So the closest to a full tabulation of how many victories an athlete won is uh, I Napoli 49 for, for, uh, uh, for the famous wrestler Marcus Aurelius Hermagoras. He won 29 sacred competitions and 127 prize competitions. And they laid it out, all out, but they did not add it up. So the two numbers to, together give a total of 156, but that's not here. The second example is the list for Titus Flavius Metrobius from Yassos. And the S elastic games were introduced by the single participle in Nikisas. And at the end of the inscription, there is a summation of 120 other uh, contests uh, that were not necessary that were not, not necessary to mention in, in full detail. So the two individuals here also happen to be the top three most successful athletes in Go's list. So Go tried to document, try to make a list of all the, the most successful athletes that we know of in the ancient world, and they don't they don't add the total, they just list out what's there. And so that's interesting to me. And the third example, um, the last one, is from Tiberius Claudius Callimorphus, which represents the majority. It's uh, the layout represents the majority of uh, the 64 inscriptions that try to sum up or count victories. Um, the elastic victories were not tallied, but presented as a list. So here we have Niki Santa Hierus Agonas Tus Hippogramenus, and then the list goes on. Uh, and the and so, in other words, the preliminary survey here suggests that adding elastic victories to prize victories uh, was not the standard 
practice in the ancient world and when they're trying to make a victory list. And this is understandable when we consider the nature of its elastic victories. They come with triumphs, pensions, and specific and unique honors given by the victor's home city. We know that Pliny specifically wrote in his letter to Trajan that he had to sign off the victor's benefits. What Marcianus Rufus' victory list then amounts to is essentially a complete expose of what sort of benefits he should be receiving from the city. And it's almost like a city's contract with him since the uh, very last line is uh, ek, uh, dogmata pules. And uh, so adding his elastic and prize victory together would only make sense to a simple quantitative measure of success for us. But it seems that when they're drafting victory lists, they were operating on a different operate, operating logic. And if we consider that the numbers don't add up for Marcianus' uh, Rufus's list, it is necessary to think about other alternatives. So can the row and the new be something other than the sum of victories? And one possibility that I can come up with is the era. So uh, the Sinopean era, eras, that they, they have two, but we'll get to that later, is known from inscription, uh, from, from coins, and the epoch seems to be 46 slash 49 BCE when Caesar sent veterans to Sinope and made the city a colony. And on this coin, we see the legend on the obverse, faint traces of the eighth year, anno uh, octo, uh, to the right of the laureate head. And on the reverse, we see XDD, so for ex decreto decurion, decurionum. Uh, the same combination continues uh, so the, the Anno plus the XDD, this combination continues down to the ring of Gaius before XDD is dropped from the remaining of the Sinopean series that run to uh, the ring of Gallianus. And there are two hurdles to this interpretation. The first is that the Sinopean era is not attested at all on Sinopean inscriptions, only on coins, at least from the inscriptions that we know of that French was able to uh, uh, publish and document and publish. That includes also David Robinson's work. Uh, we don't have any Sinopean inscriptions on uh, in inscriptions. And the second hurdle is that the normal chronographic practice among Greek cities and Roman Asia Minor and, and the Greek world in general, and we have seen that uh, in the uh, in, in, in the uh, earlier presentations, is to use the genitive etus or the dative to ete, um, before or during or sort of bracketing the Greek numerals when the concept of the era is specifically invoked. At the very least, before the Greek numerals, there has to be a preceding article to in the data. That said, th that's the normal practice. That's, that's the commonly seen practice. That said, uh, we can find nice examples of eras used without any of those, um, without the tol etei, without the bitus. So the first example is a dedicatory inscription drafted by an official from King Roimetalke's court. So he is the king of the Bosporan kingdom uh, in the Crimea. And the second, also from the Crimea, is from a cultic organization so what I'm getting at here is these are all official or at least social organizations that are using this practice. It's not just a individual person who forgets to write it down or something like that. It's, it's acceptable, at least in the, as, at, at least in the Black Sea world. Right. And the third example is perhaps uh, very interesting to me because it's from, um, from uh, ambassadors from the city of Amastris. So Amastris is in the same province as Sinope in uh, Bithynia at Pontus, just about like 150 kilometers west um, across mountainous terrain, but still, if you ride by boat, it's quite close. So Amastrian ambassadors went to the Bosporan kingdom and then they set up inscriptions and they, in one example, they don't use any of the 
Atei or the Itus to mark the date. So let's get back to the Marcianus Rufus inscription. Now, the problem here is that uh, in, the, in these examples, the simple Greek numerals are always followed by the name of the month. So that's pretty, that's pretty regular. Here, after the Greek numerals, we don't know if there is a month name to it. It's so damaged. And this is probably what the stone looks, looked like uh, when, uh, when uh, Reinach and when Bean um, saw it and uh, documented it. It's not very strong evidence, I agree, but here is something that is absent. And to me, that's sort of interesting. Uh, and hypothetically, if Rho and Nu are indeed letters of the Sinopian era, then what would the year be? So I'm just taking a leap of faith and say, perhaps this is, and if it is, what year would it be? Would it be strange? Would it be out of context with the contact with the contents of the inscription? And we get back to the two Sinopian eras. So during the Severan period, a new era was put in place with an epoch of 70 slash 69 BCE. And this would not work for our year, for our row and new because the end result would be 80 uh, CE. And that would be before uh, the uh, revival of the Capitolinian games by Domitian in 86 CE. So that's not possible. What about the earlier era, the, the one that's used um, uh, before the Severan period the, that starts from 46 to 45 BCE? Well, that would put the year in 105 CE, so squarely in the Trajanic period, which is, to me, it's a nice coincidence, right? Um, so to conclude, if the arguments set out in this paper can be accepted, then Merrick's interpretation is the most likely. Uh, in the time of Trajan, there was a boxer, Marcianus Rufus, etc. I note that Merrick did not, to my knowledge, um, clarify in his publications why he saw this inscription as Trajanic, but the absence of the Panhellenic games among, his, among, among the boxers' various achievements may have been the, uh, the uh, circumstantial limiting factor that could say it's probably before Hadrian, since he's so successful and he's, he should be able to win, but he didn't. It must be that uh, there was no Panhellenia yet. I guess that's the assumption. Uh, while this paper hopes to provide an alternative possibility that could further confirm Merrick's assumptions, given the significant damages observable from the squeeze evidence, along with other inhibiting factors, such as the lack of evidence for the use of the era in Sinopian inscriptions, and the absence of references to the year or the month, I submit that significant problems remain. And um, I welcome any comments or suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shangwen. That was yeah, to to yeah, lead us through uh, these uh, numbers. Uh, any questions? As once again, you can write in the chat or uh, let us know, and we'll unmute you. Meanwhile, do we have from other places uh, that have the two eras, uh, a, a kind of random use of one rather than the other? Or do you have parallels from elsewhere that could show that someone would go back to the earliest era? Oh, um, yeah. So to, to clarify, the Sinopian era is quite it's quite con consistent. So they stuck with the earlier era for the, so they stuck with the earlier era for a good 200, 
to, for a good close to 300 years before they started to wobble and drop it off. Okay, uh, okay, yeah, sorry, yeah, I misunderstood, yeah, okay. That makes sense. Yeah, but uh, for the question of two euros, yes, the Macedonian, so we get the act, so we get the Actian and the provincial. It's kind of it's kind of weird, and in Bithynia we get weird numbers in some of the inscriptions that suppose that that seems to be the era. So it's, I, I re, if I remember correctly, some of those have etus uh, attached to it, but we don't know what the epoch is, and but the Bithynian era. So but. In Bithynia, there's also, as uh, the previous uh, presenter already mentioned, uh, the use of the euro based on emperor's ring year, so the sixth year of Nero, mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. So they sort of, I, I think they sort of use that two euro system, but I, I can't say for sure because the other the other set, there's no way to sort of um, get at what the epoch is. So we can't really attach historical significance. But two euro systems in Macedonia, definitely, we see both euros sometimes cited in the same inscription, things like that. So that's that's for sure. Okay, I'm checking if I'm not missing Anything, anybody who wants to just ask a question, that's perfect time. Uh, we have a question from our panelist, uh, John Morgan. Two different eras were used in the province of Macedonia. Yeah, yeah indeed, thank you for the confirmation. Yeah, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 if I could add, I would say that that there on Macedonian inscriptions, there is the era of the province of Macedonia. And then there is also, which was 148 to 7 BC. And then there's the era of Actium, which is 32 to 31 BC. And you, there are many inscriptions which refer to both of these eras. And then there are some inscriptions where, which, which refer to only one era and it's not really clear in some cases which era is meant. And one has to use letter forms to guess which of the two it is. And I think that if you review the evidence, you'll find that there does appear to have been a period of overlap where the two different eras were used within the same span of decades. Yeah, so Todd has treated the Macedonian era to perfection, or at least people sort of say that's good enough. But exactly, when and why do you, would one use a specific set of eras is, is the question. And uh, I guess Hatsopoulos has, would have um, much more to say because the so-called the provincial era has a sort of an ethnic ethnic importance attached to it and sort of speaks to identity questions and things like that. So probably we can also look towards that direction with eras in Asia Minor. Asia Minor. So Wolfgang Leshorn did a lot of work on that. And for Sinope, it's very interesting. If this Rho Nu is indeed the era, then it's a Greek inscription using a Roman colonial era that sort of says a lot about the choice of identity, that is, or the lack of choice of identity thereof. They can't really choose a era of 70 BCE that uh, sort of talks about Roman conquests, uh, the Thinian Pontus being um, annexed into the Roman Empire. So Amastris used the 70 BCE era, right? And if Sinope cannot use the 70 or was forced to not use the 70 BC era as other cities in Pontus would like to, then that speaks a lot about identity issues. But again, we have to latch a lot upon whether the Rho Nu is indeed um, an era. And that's the question here. We have, thank you for this clarification. Um, a question from Kevin Daly. Do we have any information on the relative popularity of this monument type, the inscribed Sepus? Does it have a heyday 
periods when it's not popular, either temporary or regionally? Oh, this is very nice. So I have to admit that I only started to look at the object upon which the inscription is inscribed uh, in my preparation for this talk. So I do need to look more closely at the form in which the inscription is presented. And yeah, so I have to, I have to do more research on that. And uh, yeah, I agree. And so, so these cheapest, these cheapy, they come up a lot. Um, so in Athens, yeah. So in Athens, we have a lot of these. Uh, and I, I do wonder if, if there is a, um, there is a heyday. Hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you for that question, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, we have an, another question from Christina Williamson. You might check uh, Pisidian Antioch at the shrine of Menaskenos for the CP. Mm, thank so, you. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, John Morgan, go ahead, uh, please. Um, I, I have a question for Brad Cook, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible that the reason why David Robinson didn't publish that remarkable inscription on gold is that he had some reason to worry about whether it was authentic and he didn't want to embarrass himself by publishing an inscription which would turn out to be a forgery. Well, that was the question I was trying to get at perhaps too indirectly. Um, his habit was not to publish any of his inscriptions, which is peculiar. Um, and so <laughs> that's the best answer I can give to your direct question. Um, so then the other evidence that I've looked at, he knows inscriptions very well. I mean, he's, no, he's studied inscriptions since, as I say, 1901, and then his work at Sinope. He knows Macedonia really well, of course, long before anybody was looking at inscriptions. Uh, so if anybody was in a position to question um, the the document, uh, the, the gold tablet, he would probably, at the time, but again, this is the other problem, this is when did he get it? 1910, 1920, 1930, 1940, 1957? We don't know, and that's what's so frustrating. So I can't completely, I, I'm trying to show a pattern, a little bit like what all of us have been doing, trying to show patterns. This particular pattern has to do with his own publication history so my leaning is to say, uh, we can't use that as evidence that he was suspicious of it. And the same is true of uh, Willis. Um, Kent Rigsby, who put, it, put me onto this, has said that Willis, and my point was, is Willis did so much other work, um, mainly papyri, that again, his lack of publishing it is also not evidence of any suspicion about it um, because he was so focused on details of, of absolutely everything. And Kent Rigsby said that he had, that, that Willis had a habit of, um, uh, well, worrying about the tiniest of details. And um, to go back to one of the earlier questions that Deborah asked is, it's gold for pity's sake. There's no comparanda. So I think um, I, I can't, as I said, these, the very question that you've asked um, and all of these have harried me and will continue to harry me but this thing needs to get get out there and I, and could have, to give as much context to its ancient as well to be quite honest as its modern history is my concern is is it possible to do isotopic analysis of the impurities in the gold to give some indication of where the gold came from yeah. well that was also what i was trying to get at in saying xrf since xrf is completely unintrusive Mm -hmm. um, and that's what the museum is happy with doing. That's what we've done so far. Um, so I have been talking uh, with uh, um, people elsewhere um, where they have these resources, um, whether at Johns Hopkins, and I need to get in contact with people at the Met and Harvard. Um, so that would be a next step um, to address your very point. Um, and, and, and then of course the question is, and I should say two years ago, I gave a talk on a bronze tablet, which is also in the collection. Um, and of course bronze or copper alloys have a completely different uh, opportunity for such analysis, 
gold. Yeah, unless we can find some impurities, which would require a removal of something from the tablet. And um, we have to, uh, we'll see. Thank you. Is there, thank you, Roman. Is there any question for any of the panelists since, um, thank you, uh, John, for going back to our first talk? Um, you can, that's your last chance, I guess, to uh, write in the chat or ask directly. Uh, looking again, once, one last time. Okay. Well, I, I would like to thank you all, all the panelists for uh, this really fantastic, clear, well presented, illustrated, I mean, uh, talks that was very, uh, uh, I think everybody enjoyed and you can see all the applause uh, popping up on the slides. So thanks to the panelists, thanks to the big organizer of the SCS this year who um, were able to have us all virtually. And thanks to all of you attending this, this session this Sunday. Um, so um, there, um, I, th I think there is. You to keep in touch with our panelists through email if you, know, you have questions that come after. Um, but, and I thank you all for joining. Uh, Michael McLean, you wanted to add something. Oh, I just, uh, on the chat, it, it says that there's a, a comment, not a question, oh, yeah. sorry. So uh, uh, last, um, a question, uh, a comment from um, Dr. Mason. Yes, sure. Oh, you need to unmute. Oh, you will be unmuted. Um, just tying my paper into some of the others, I was very struck with how Pontus Bathynia all of this is. Um, and note that my, my uh, person was quaestor in Bithynia Pontus, Pontus before his leadership. And secondly, to note that in the list of victories, we have several victories in the Balbilea in Ephesus, and that is Yulia Balbilea's grandfather, who was honored with games in Ephesus. So these are just points I wanted to add to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm checking once more. Uh, we had something from uh, Deborah, you wanted, I missed you, I guess. Oh, uh, no, okay. Okay, any other comments on each other? I mean, comments or suggestions, questions? Okay, I'm checking. Well, if not, I guess we just finished five minutes earlier and we are giving to let the room occupied by the next group. Uh, I thank everybody once again for this wonderful panel and for the journey through the ancient world. Um, thank, thanks again to everybody. So, uh, and see you next year, I guess. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.